pretty basics of rotablation techniques to slowly and slowly gradually build up to more complex scenario and trying to make each and every one of you who are attending comfortable as well as in times to come proficient in the uh, in the procedure of rotablation so as we move in the program certain sections of the program would appear very basic to those people who have been exposed more and in certain areas of the program will appear very complex to those people who have not been exposed at all but please bear with us as slowly and slowly you will see we will as we will evolve we will try to bring everyone to the same level and try to make each one of you comfortable with the use of rotation so as i said this is not one of the shelf program this is the step one of the program for that will be lasting for the whole one year and as i told you the first part of this program would be web based training it will basically deal with the fundamentals of rotablation how is it is performed what are uh, what are the tips and tricks what are the case selection criteria how do you select which cases to do so all the basics of rotablation techniques as well as the few case and the clinical scenarios that would help you learn from other people's problems mistakes experience and try to build a form of some kind of an image of rotablation and how it is to be done in real world scenario when the travel restrictions go away very soon we would like to meet those of you who want to continue in this program we would like to meet you physically we would like to bring you over to our centers to train you not on wet models but on real patients and we have had these programs in the past where physicians have come to our center from all across india and they have had real were real experience on real patients doing rotablation cases as as primary operators with we helping them and these programs in past have been immensely popular we expect to see a few of you in these programs in the years in in the months to come and then there will be a step 3 when you have when you have graduated from step 1 and step 2 and you want to start a few cases in your own lab and you are a little bit hesitant for the first couple of cases let's say four five cases you can pull these cases up up any one of the faculty members among us will be more than happy to travel to your hospital stand aside just see you do a case as an independent first operator just to provide some sort of a logic stick or moral uh, support while you do a first few cases so as you see here this is an entire um, horizon of from web based trainings to mentorship programs and we want more and more people out of you uh, to join and this program as we move forward in this year So after this uh, session of around two and a half hours today is over, we would send you a Google form in which we would like to like to understand what whether your expectations of this program from this webinar was met, this masterclass was met, as well as we would like to know more about you in terms of your your inclination to join future courses and the mentorship program in times to come, and this will really help us select those candidates because as you know. when we call people for hands on training we cannot invite more than 5 people per session because uh, that would not allow um, more uh, exposure per patient so uh, those of you who you are really interested and we, which will be based upon this performa that you uh, fill and send it to us and we would like to select a few of you to come and train with us in our institute with that i give uh, the session over to my uh, course uh, co director Professor Sharad Chandra, who is a professor in the Department of Cardiology, along with me, and an extraordinary and a well-known interventional cardiologist um, in India, he is an exceptionally uh, talented interventional cardiologist, very proficient in rotablation, and I would like uh, him to, you know, introduce our August panel members to in front of all of you, and then probably we can move ahead in the program. Dr. Sharad, please. Good evening, everybody. as dr rishi rightly pointed out the importance of this rota ablation because this is a very this is a new thing this is is a uh, very well established thing and we should learn about rota and definitely in this in these five six lectures some things are repetition but the repetitions are good for the beginners as well as for the trained ones also so uh, uh, we have two guest men uh, mentors uh, in our program one is dr ajit menon he will be joining a bit late and other is dr ranjan sethi dr ranjan sethi is a senior intervention cardiologist in manipal hospital bangalore he is expert in uh, complex pci as well as he is a pioneer in left atrial appendage uh, device closure in southeast asia he authored and co-authored more than 50 publications and he is principal in co-investigation of multiple trials 
so uh, our uh, course faculty they are dr akshay pradhan he is professor in our department and dr gaurav choudhary he is also professor in department cardiology king george medical university and dr pravesh he is also professor uh, in king george medical university and we have two other speakers also dr sanjeev kadaria from delhi and dr Sh dr devin shrimal from jaipur so uh, i think we should start the program right now yeah so uh, thank you thank you dr sharad for introducing all of uh, all of the guest mentors uh, i mean uh, five of the faculty are from our department but i would really like to welcome uh, dr shetty dr menon dr devin dr sanjeev uh, a very good and an old friend uh, it's really nice to see all of you here so today we will be after this uh, welcome and introductory uh, words we would like to move on to Dr. Gaurav for his IVAS image interpretation for calcified lesions. How do we identify calcified lesions? Because we have to identify the enemy first before we set on to target it. Then we would go on to Dr. Pravesh Vishkarma who would talk about calcified lesions. What are the challenges which are faced and what all other treatment options available? Is rotablation the best option available? Or there are other options available? Or can we use different options in different clinical settings of calcified lesions? Then I would be briefly speaking about rotablation ethnectomy, the basics of the machine, the basic principles, the basic techniques of rotablation, and then followed by Dr. Menon, who would be speaking about more complex cases, indications, contraindications, case selections. And then we would be having our friend from Boston Scientific, uh, Deepak, who would be telling us about rot rotational ethnectomy system setup, troubleshooting, basically more about the machine and how to get going about that. And then we would be having two excellent cases by Dr. Devane and Dr. Sanjeev Kathuria, who would be discussing predominantly about complicated cases, complications according to rotablation, and various other um, uh, case-based learning in the session. So a few housekeeping sessions, I would request all the speakers to stick to their 15 minutes time zone. And after each 15 minutes lecture, we are going to have five to seven minutes of discussion. I would request Professor Akshay to uh, pick up those questions from the audience and try to get the conversation going after each lecture and any one of the faculty members as as well as the presenter can answer those questions so that we can handle each lecture separately in part of the discussion and we can carry on the remaining part in the panel discussions at the end. So with this I would uh, like to introduce um, Dr. Gaurav here, an excellent orator and with a special interest in intravascular imaging both IVAS and OCT and let's see what he's got to say about the identification and interpretation of calcified lesions in intravascular imaging. Over to you, Dr. Gaurav. Thank you, sir. I would like to share my screen. Uh, hope the screen is visible, sir. Yes, it is visible. Yes, it yeah. is visible. Go ahead. I am audible? Yeah. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Uh, very good evening uh, to all of you for being in this program. Uh, that is one of the unique program. We are starting from the basics. So, as uh, Dr. Rishi sir has told, first we should identify our, our enemy. So, uh, what actually this enemy leads to? So, we all know that calcified lesions respond poor to endoplasty, difficult to dilate. You can see this dog boning is there may prevent the adequate stand delivery to the desired location and even if you are able to there is often under expansion and there is a lot of male opposition in a calcified uh, lesion so uh, we all are aware that these are the sequelae of the calcium that is present um, and uh, the important thing that should be in a mind that if you are doing a 100 angioplasty then in three to five percent cases we may encounter that this calcium so 90 percent of the time you will see you will have a greeny road without any problems you can clearly navigate of this but many times you can come and encounter a calcium in the coronaries so where there is a will there is a way so what are the ways to look at it of course we can identify uh, severe calcium on classical and geography conventional geography seeing the uh, calcium in two views orthogonal perpendicular and on the two layers of the vessel but to be more precise if we are in a confusion that it is a moderate to severe or we want to 
decide whether we want to take any debulking strategy up front, then of course the imaging is an important aspect. And out of these, we have presently two imaging modalities, OCT and IVAS. And for calcium, I think uh, IVAS has an edge over OCT. So just as Dr. Rishi told, we are just not embarking into a very complex thing, but I would just like to show this image. That is, it is how a normal artery looks like. So it is a circular structure inside. So this is the catheter, then it is a wire artifact. And we can uh, quantify these three layers into bright, dark, and bright. Bright is the intima, dark is the media, and bright again is the adventitia. It is similar to what we see in OCT also. So once you we can have a mild fatty plaque, that can be seen from three to nine o'clock the eco images is less brighter but once it is a five row fatty then you can see that it is a bit more uh, reflection is more but when you have a calcium you can see there's a bright moon full moon you can see it is called as 360 degree calcium so we should keep these images in our mind that once you will see a calcium it would be bright and we can further quantify or we can corroborate these findings because many center would be having OCT also. Yes, I would love, just give only one to two slides about OCT. But this is how a calcium looks like. So in IVAS, the main principle is a back scattering followed by which is having a post acoustic shadow. So on this B image, you can see it is the same patient. You can see this bright structure is calcium like crescent of moon and behind this black so it is what is ultrasound principle the waves would be reflected back they will not be transmitted so it will lead to a darker shadow whereas in OCT it would be a image that would be shown like this a dark structure a seed like structure which has a delineation a proper delineated proper margins of calcium it is a thick calcium we can see from this from here, 3 to 7 o'clock, again, you see a calcified structure. It is a well demarcated, darker structure as compared to the fibrous intima, which is bright. We can see contemporary to this D, it is at the same location, in the same artery at a different location. You can see in D image, you get a brighter whitish shadow that is calcium. And behind this, it is a darker shadow that is the post acoustic shadow. So always you'll get a bright white structure followed by a, which has a, post acoustic shadow that is blackening behind this calcium so this is, is a clue for the calcium in the coronary artery and why we are talking about ivus mainly because on convention angiography you can identify only 40 percent of the cases in ivus you can identify up to 82 percent as compared to the oct which has a yield around 76 percent so it's a good modality to plan our cases and to look what is inside the coronary artery so what actually ivus Calcium looks like a bright hyperechoic deposit corresponding sharp at acoustic shadow. So again, arrow you can see it's a brightest structure there at six o'clock, also brightest structure from three to six o'clock. You can see, and there is a post acoustic shadow. And there's a high sensitivity and high specificity around 90 to 100 percent for large dense calcium deposits or calcium microcalcification clusters. And I was uh, gives an idea about what is the extent, whether it is superficial or deep. So I will come into the detail of what is superficial, what is deep, and what is the arc. So it's like simple maths. If you make a radius, if you see a bright structure with post acoustic shadowing, it can be up uh, like 180 degree. It can be superficial and deep. So what is actually superficial calcium? So we are seeing from the lumen side. If it is just near the catheter, it is superficial. If it is away from the catheter on the adventitial, it is deep. But to remember this superficial calcium is the calcium that is going to cause a problem because here that will prevent the stent entry and the ballooning of this lesion. So it is diff very difficult to put a stent across this lesion which has a superficial calcium. So there are two methods to quantify the superficial and deep and what is the arc of the calcium. So again coming on to the mild, moderate and severe. So if you see it is, if it is less than one quadrant or less than 90 degree, it is a, so, uh, it is a mild calcium. If it is moderate calcium, that is, it is around a half moon. You can see it's a bright crescent like shape and it is 90 to 80 degrees. So up to 80 degree it is moderate and beyond 180 degree, that is 270 degree or 360 degree, it is quantified as a severe calcium. So we need a dedicated debulking or plaque modification strategy in moderate to severe calcium.
because with mild calcium you, we can go away with the semi compliant or a non compliant balloon or high opn pressure like balloon but in definitely moderate and severe calcified lesions we need to go ahead with the rotablation or opn or laser or uh, this ivl so we can see what this rotablation would do so we can see uh, same artery at two location in the figure d you see it's a very uh, lumen is very less 1.9 and you can see 270 degree of a brighter white structure so this is the calcium and the area is just 1.9 mm square but once do rotablation you will get a fissure in this calcium and you will get a break in this calcium and you will get a area around 3.4 mm square so with this debulking or plaque modification by this rotablation but you can achieve a better area and the calcium thickness would be reduced and we can break this calcium with the nc balloon another important thing many times we cannot see a very uh, large amount of calcium on fluoroscopy or cine but once you do ivas you see uh, when the balloon is sometimes not able to go uh, the passage of balloon is difficult you can see the can see a nodular kind of thing you will see a calcium with a post acoustic shadow so it is a nodular calcium and this is our uh, uh, picture of ocd of our own patient a young patient with acs you can see it's a well circumscribed conical type of thing uh, structure by uh, dark structure well circumscribed so this is a calcium nodule again this, this is a calcium nodule it is localized and these are types of lesion that are make artery more prone for rupture and perforation so uh, this was a brief about the imaging how do calcium looks like so i'll not go into the detail because dr pravesh would be discussing this in detail so once you have angiographic mild calcium then non attractors the strategy is good but you have a moderate to severe calcium on ivs or ct and especially ivs because calcium is better delineated by ivs then we should go up front with the rotablation atherectomy by plaque modification we can uh, keep the bud size around 0.5 to point six so that dr rishi would discuss in detail how to select the bar size and but we have to keep in mind that once you get a moderate to severe calcium then it is going to cause a trouble in a stent passage stent expansion so we need to go ahead up front with the protebation attractive strategy it's again all small and similar strategy but the important thing i want to emphasize in this everything goes okay once you are able to pass a imaging catheter but if the calcium is so much or the lumen diameter is that you cannot pass a imaging catheter then of course we have to take our rota bar of smallest size or 1.25 or 1.5 to start with some operator prefer 1.25 but some operator goes straight away with 1.5 so this is first you have to make a way then you can take a opn balloon or nc balloon and after atherectomy and you can finish up with the ivas imaging whether you have got adequate expansion or position or whether we need to uh, expand the lesion with more non a non compliant balloon at higher pressures so just i will uh, show only two cases uh, in which the imaging could uh, help uh, of help to us so first important thing that dr rishi has also emphasized we should start with the simple cases then escalate to the complex one because it is not a complex technique it is a very simple technique but the selection of the cases is very important so it's a 66 year old hypertensive male presented with a stable angina and his angiogram was done so this is how a calcium looks like on angiogram so you can see the the lumen is also reduced at this point and there is a calcium in the mid area so this uh, lesion for beginners or just to start with so these were our initial few cases so you can see the lesion length is uh, around less than 3 uh, cm it is non angulated non tortuous and this was i was run so we can see this is more than 270 degree arc of calcium that can be seen in the right lower panel it is a bright white structure with post acoustic shadow so it's we planned a dedicated rotablation in this case and we took a 1.5 bar and uh, this uh, lesion after crossing the wire with micro catheter rota wire was passed across the lesion and this gentle packing motion go hit come back go hit come back is the thing that a doctor she would be uh, showing in the coming presentation so this is the basis of uh, rotablation that we need not to keep the bar between the lesion we should go hit and come back and gentle packing motion should be done we should not be in a hurry otherwise you can have a cocassive phenomenon that is the bar get strapped after the lesion then the things were simple and the lesion was 
pre-dilated with NC balloon and two deaths were deployed and this was a satisfactory result was obtained. So these are the few initial cases that we need to do. And once you go, uh, once you have done few 10, 15 cases, then we can go ahead with the more uh, complex cases, even in the setting. So this is the last case. I'm going to just finish with this case. 45 year old female with LV dysfunction, with left dominant circulation, with LED1, um, 111 classification, 90% lesion, LCX was intermediate, but Centex score being low, uh, the patient decided to go for a cabbage. LCX, uh, FFR was negative, so we just planned this LED even bifurcation because FFR of circumflex was normal. And what the made of LED just prior to the bifurcation had a 270 degree arc. So we just just to emphasize this image, it's like a bright moon which has a cow's post acoustic shadowing, blackening, and this is the catheter. And we can see that here we need a dedicated rotablation. So uh, again, the similar step wiring was done. Then uh, this uh, rotable after I was this. Uh, Rotablation bar was uh, moved in the LED, passed across the lesion, and uh, once this uh, bar was going adequately, then uh, other steps of the mini crush bifurcation was done after. But the important thing, the wire in the diagonal was taken out by the time of the rotablation. So pre dilatation was done with two ten balloon. Then at the, this was a mini crush and. At the end, we could see a satisfactory end result. FKBI was done, and this was the end result. So here also, uh, if the physiological imaging helped in making the help by FFR that whether to move for uh, left main bifurcation, but circumflex FFR was uh, normal negative, and the I was helped in making a choice that we need to go with the upfront rotablation or should try try with the balloons. But we saw there was a 270 degree arc. So in this, a dedicated um, this uh, uh, rotablation strategy was required, and uh, the LED deeper uh, bifurcation mini crush strategy was done. So overall, it was a case in which the imaging should be done. So uh, this is algorithm. The thing that I already told: if the calcium is moderate, then we should plan with the debulking strategy, especially by rotablation. So just to summarize uh, my presentation, we should start with simple cases first, then escalate to the complex one. Initially, discrete lesion less than 3 cm non-angulated should be selected because in these also the passage of the IVAS catheter would be easier. IVAS should be optimally used prior to rotablation. If you find an arc, brighter arc, white arc, more than 180 degree, then it should be uh, dealt with rotablation. Calcium nodule, even if you don't get get uh, this uh, arc, but you get a nodular type of structure, then also it should be dealt carefully because it is going to cause trouble in passing even uh, stents. And good expansion, optimal opposition is obtained once you use uh, IVAS imaging after rotablation. And the strategy to use rotablation prior to procedure should be made rather than always using it as a bailout. Once you have identified calcium on fluoroscopy, then you should go with the IVAS imaging. And if there is a arc is more than 270 degree or 180 degree, then you should keep your rota bar ready. And we should do a plaque modification rather than total debulking. That means a lower size of bar could be of use even in a very heavy calcified. So thank you all for patience listening. Thank you, Dr. Gaurav. So Dr. Gaurav, uh, this is a wonderful presentation. You rightly pointed out the importance of imaging in uh, calcified lesion. As you said that uh, the arc more than 180 is also import is important. Rest two things are thickness of the calcium as well as length of the calcium. So once the length is more than 5 millimeter and thickness is more than 500 micron, then these are the probable candidates for uh, debulking strategy. So Dr. Gora, I have one question for you. Suppose um, as uh, uh, some of the operators are new and if someone in the center doesn't, they don't have the facility of uh, IVAS, then what should be the criteria for to use uh, rota ablation? It's a just only uh, calcium present on the two orthogonal view, or some other points are also there by which you can say this is the candidate for rota ablation or debulking strategy, rather than saying only by uh, IVAS imaging. 
Yes, sir. It is very important because many times, uh, even if we have an imaging, we are not able to pass the imaging catheter. So one is the fluoroscopic or cine that you have already told to orthogonal, mutually perpendicular views with calcium on both sides of the arteries on intimal edges. And uh, most important thing that what you follow, I have seen, you just pass a wire and we just take a 2.5 balloon, NC or some brand. If it is passing easily, then we can go with the NC balloon or opian balloon. But if uh, it is not able to pass, then we should not uh, waste our time in just uh, selecting various balloon. We should uh, come to a conclusion that is this lesion is not going to yield or it's not going to have a good expansion or it is not going to prepare a good bed for the stent uh, delivery. So this is one thing that we can follow. Another is the angiographic uh, that in if in the still images, in the still fluoro still images, you are getting a calcium on the uh, fluoroscopy and the two views. Then of course it is again a situation where we would need uh, this uh, rotablation up front. Yeah, right, Professor. Basically, we should not waste time uh, if you are doing some calcific lesion and the so, balloon, um, oh. and balloon is not going. And if the balloons are rupturing, you are taking one balloon, one of one balloon of one millimeter, one point two, and balloon are rupturing, then don't waste time and try to that reason. That's the best time to shift to the rota. And uh, if you are uh, having some tram track so appearance, a... your pardon. No, go ahead, go ahead, sir. And if you are having some tram track calcification on the angio angiography, then probably this is also a candidate for debulking strategy. Yes. Yes, Dr. Rishi, please. Yeah, so uh, uh, may I bring Dr. Ranjan Shetty in the conversation and uh, say and find out if there are any questions from the audience and uh, we will take those questions. Uh, Dr. Shetty, in your experience and in your practice, uh, how much is, is your reliance uh, uh, with the tabulation is to be used or not? And uh, a little tricky question, uh, in the two intravascular imaging techniques, what is your view of IVERS versus OCT? Where your XPCI setting, multi-vessel PCI, and um, thank you, Dr. Rishi. If I, I think the uh, first question was, uh, I think when do we use rota, uh, right, uh, uh, Dr. Rishi? Yeah, I think overall, no, I think it's when to fight. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gaurav. It was a beautiful uh, presentation. Uh, I think you made most of the points uh, extremely clear. The message, I think, is also very clear. The message is to use it not as a last resort, but use it early on. You know, when you think that you're going to be in a um, no problem, uh, that is when you should use. Because today's era, you know, angioplasty is not done just for type A lesions. We venture into a little more complex um, uh, lesions. So it's very important that we optimize our result and very important that our results will be equivalent to CABG. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. And with calcium is probably the most important. Thrombus and calcium and obviously the and uh, these three are the major villains which we see in cat lab. So today, I think uh, discussion about calcium is extremely important. It's also, uh, and as Dr. Rishi was trying to say, today we have many modalities available, many modalities of imaging and many modality of uh, uh, therapeutic options also, some of which have been already uh, named. So if we have, a, if it, the calcium is one of the strongest indicator for imaging. So if you think of calcium or if you suspect calcium, it has to be imaging. So if we can combine both the questions um, of Dr. Rishi to choose which is the imaging modality, obviously there is fluoro, uh, both do quite well, that is what we need to understand. Pre-stenting, uh, I was does reasonably well, so does OCT, but post-stenting, I think OCT will have definite uh, uh, better edge over I was. And as far as calcium is concerned, although the sensitivity of uh, I was is better, uh, the OCT describes it better. You know, when the OCT came uh, in market and when it was there, everybody thought that I was will be superior to OCT as far as calcium is concerned. 
but it was not truly so because you know that um, which i am uh, dr gaurav did show a lot of beautiful images where you are not able to see beyond the initial arc you don't know how thick it is because ultrasound just it's like if you put a echo machine on a rib you don't see anything so the same thing happens when there is calcium uh, so i think uh, that's why both both do extremely well we don't have to choose too much if you have to earlier rule was if you have one imaging it has to be ivs because ivs could be used pre ivs could be used post but over the periods oct we have learned to use oct well and uh, oct does show more information which is needed and for calcium again oct does a very very uh, good job now coming to the one more point which dr gaurav has highlighted is uh, uh, you know that superficial versus deep because now we have lots of therapeutic option we cannot be i'm sure we are going to have more discussion we should understand uh, i think now we should talk, just talk about some of the aspects if you think of using rota you should use it unless there is a real contraindication the bezel is very tortuous or your rota is going to be complicated so you need to use it don't use it like a bailout because by the time you already dissected your wire is now biased you know and the overall complication goes up so if you have imaging use imaging and get guided by imaging if you don't have imaging and if you think there is some calcium and you're not um, you know sure about superficial deep use rota again if you do a imaging you find a deeper calcium rota may not work uh, very well but anything which is superficial with anything which is luminal it works well and also we should understand the basic concept that rota is actually milder on the vessel it's not you know just because there is a diamond bar people think it is more harmful but simple ballooning is more harmful because you know it has to produce uncontrolled uh, dissection which we, uh, compared to that a rota is much smoother it's like our shaving blade it doesn't actually harm your skin uh, uh, it is actually more milder so it's very important to use and start with the initially at least till it's like driving right so initially drive in a safe way so led straight some calcium is better then maybe rca l6 is for you know later so uh, it's all always about uh, safety did we answer the question dr rishi or uh, you answered it more than perfectly uh, yeah uh, another another point just a little bit of uh, i for one uh, when we are when i am um, uh, is a when i'm doing a complicated case um, multi vessel especially and where rover whether um, you know um, rotablation is probably i'm thinking of using using rotablation in one or two vessels uh, one of the factors that bore bear on my mind is also uh, in oct the amount of contrast used and amount of this so sometimes you know for that reason i would i would fall more upon uh, ivers and uh, somehow maybe as a matter of choice i would go more for ivers in those cases in which i have multi vessel disease and rotablation but i completely completely agree with you that um, they are almost equal as far as uh, the pre decision is concerned and for post tenting oct would have a little bit of an edge over rota over i techniques so um Sanjeev, you you Sanjeev, answered the, and what if you yes and you come so on i, I really feel one very important difference is that both of especially i was cannot tell you the depth of calcium at all because it becomes dark once you get a calcium there the appreciation of depth of calcium is never there with an i was not much there with an i was but the other important thing is once you've talked about using any kind of uh, modality for your plaque modification the important thing to know is about a superficial or a deep calcium because one should know that rota or an orbital are more useful with a superficial calcium mode once you are able to appreciate a deep calcium because if you do an imaging you are able to know there is a deep calcium the role of scoring balloon cutting balloon and the iwl actually comes into the picture so uh, as sir has pointed out rather than just trying a therapy first doing a ballooning getting a dissection and then going for a a plaque modification therapy even in plaque modification therapy one should be reasonably sure which one is going to act better in a particular case like in a nodule i probably nobody no nothing except rotablation will work probably in a deeper calcium the cutting balloon or the scoring balloon will do a better job than rota so that in that way also imaging is a very very useful tool because amongst the available 
armamentarium which one to be used preferably is also very important thing let's say we don't have it and a very important thing in a rota is the is the bias of the rota wire if you are having a calcium on the medial side and your bias is on the is on the lateral side you can be rest assured that rota might not be useful in that case because rota is going to tend to do its differential cutting on the side where the wire bias is there so imaging does help in knowing which one you can select better the important thing is whether we are able to appreciate a deep calcium in ivus with i feel is little uh, drawback of an ivus that is going to be important because we can choose our therapy according uh, i completely agree with you dr kachuria uh, uh, but uh, let me play the devil's advocate and it's always nice to you know uh, from multiple points for the benefit of the of the audience and for our benefit of our own learning uh would i be wrong in saying and that it's a superficial calcium that's the real culprit when we are doing pci and when we tend to focus so if it has if it is a superficial calcium then the root ablation so you may have superficial calcium along with the deep calcification you may have just the deep calcification without superficial calcium and you may just have a superficial calcium so in the two scenarios that you have superficial calcium the root ablation would probably tend to uh dominate as far as the therapy of choice because it will be the best case for for debulking the superficial calcium as far as the deep calcium goes sometimes you know if we tend to focus too much on deep calcium and uh, in the absence of superficial calcium so we are the patient and i and as with the superficial calcium or deep calcium along with superficial calcium needs to be tackled and Need that scoring bills, and I, I better candidate say, but superficial calcium I feel is the bigger enemy as far as uh, those kind of things uh, is concerned. And your point about uh, the wire bias, so valid when uh, uh, selecting an um, MA, which is uh, which is uh, which is a literature when you are trying to select. why birds that are on a larger size if your mla is very narrow if you have a napkin and then calcification and you are selecting let's say a 1.5 generally it will drill through and generally the issue of wire bias will come by the putting it very calcified lesion superficial calcium there partial Rishi, your voice is breaking. breaking rishi your voice is breaking i think uh, thank you dr ranjan dr sanjeev for your valuable suggestions i think uh, we should move to now our second lecture and dr pravesh are you here dr pravesh will be the next speaker and he will be speaking on challenging calcified lesion challenging challenge faced and the treatment options dr pravesh are you here yes sir i am here please a very good evening to everyone so with the past presentation by dr gaurav and the discussion which followed i think half of my job is already done can you see my slides yes yes your slides are visible here yeah. yeah thank you so my job is to just to enumerate and to see how the treat uh, various challenges we face in our, our cath labs whenever we are encountered with calcified coronary lesions and what are the treatment options we have so i'll just start from this uh, as dr gaurav already told from various studies 20 to 30% of the pci patients tend to have moderate to severe calcium calcium and with the increasing age and chronic kidney disease and diabetes mellitus prevalence we expect that this number will go still higher up so we'll uh, we are bound to have more and more number of severe calcifications in our cath labs and these calcifications don't come alone most of the times these severe and moderate calcifications are coupled with further complexities like bifurcation lesions left mains or even chronic total occlusions so uh having a severe calcification is actually a harbinger of adverse outcome this is a study from uh, seven clinical death trials i'll just summarize the findings that 
patients who had moderate to severe calcification as compared to those patients where there was no calcium where there was absence of severe calcification patients risk of dying was almost twice as high they even had a higher chances of myocardial infarction earlier the traditional teaching was that because uh, the calcific lesions are actually the stable plaques nothing bad happens to them once there is a calcification this plaque will never rupture or cause mi but over the period of time we realize we have realized that even the calcified lesions can give rise to unstable anginas non st elevation mis and even the solitary calcific nodules are one of the hypotheses apart from plaque rupture and plaque uh, erosion as a causative agent behind the acute coronary syndromes and to further complicate the issues having a severe calcification means the patient is less likely to undergo a complete revascularization again a similar finding from another study the patient's chances of uh, death are very uh, almost twice as high the chances of target vessel failure including target vessel mi revascularization go up surprisingly the uh, chances of stent thrombosis were more or less similar despite the presence of severe calcification so now coming to challenges whenever we do an angiogram obviously the cath lab starts with an angiogram so whenever we do an angiogram we find a moderate to severe calcification it becomes a interventionist nightmare so apart from the for the majorly obvious risk of a tlf there are several other issues which an interventionist faces in his cath lab for example i'll just enumerate first thing is failure to identify the calcium and a failure to assess the amount of calcium in cor simple coronary angiogram so if you rely heavily on our coronary angiogram we might miss on coronary uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, in assessing the severity of the calcium i'll come to this point again and difficulty in delivering devices it may be balloon it may be wire it may be micro catheters it can be stent or imaging catheters also if you are able to pass a balloon up to the lesion there may be difficulty in dilating if you go on a higher pressure there may be dog boning causing dissections and perforations at the high pressure edges uh, even if you are able to successfully create a bed sometimes because of tortuosity associated with this calcific calcific lesions which increases the increases the rigidity of the coronary vessels you are fail you fail to deliver the stent to the desired location or sometimes you the stent is stripped of the balloons while manipulating manipulating multiple times if you are able to deliver the stent sometimes the stent might not expand fully leading to under expansion and malposition further leading to stent thrombosis uh with the drug eluting stents there may be polymer disruption and impaired drug delivery and all these things the under expansion malposition impaired drug delivery all are the reason behind the higher chances of target lesion failure namely the stent thrombosis later on restenosis mis and increased chances of death so i'll first start with the uh, lesion assessment so there is a dictum which says if you fail to plan you are planning to fail so whenever you find a calcium or whenever any angiography or any any ptca for that matter you must give a thought process to what you are going to do so first you have to assess the severity of anything what we are seeing so same is true for the calcium so you see you diagnose you assess the severity and then you plan so this is the slide shown by dr garo so this is a study by wang et al so as per this study ios was the most sensitive one in detecting the calcium but if we rely on the angiography so angiography was able to identify only half of those calcifications so if we uh, we are talking here about moderate to severe calcification so even moderate to severe calcification only half of the uh, calcifications are diagnosed successfully by angiography that means there may be half of the patient half of those lesions where you might think that this is a simple lesion you go and dilate and the balloon doesn't dilate properly and this is another about apart from presence about the severity so angiography alone if you rely on angiography you would be able to identify only 70 to 75% of three quadrant calcium that is about 182 to 70 degree calcium uh, uh, calcium mark and if you talk about four quadrant calcium that is more than 270 270 degree arc you will be able to identify only 80% of those calciums so i mean to say that relying heavily on angiogram 
if you are dealing with the calcium lesion can put you into troubles now coming with the imaging star the guidance uh, obviously ivs versus oct how does the calcium behave uh, the, uh, what are the difficulties in assessing so as you can see this from uh, this picture ivs here it shows you a calcium it's a deep seated calcium away from the lumen away from the catheter so it is a deep calcium but in oct because oct has got a deep uh, poorer tissue penetration sometimes it may fail to show you the deeper calciums so with oct you may fail to diagnose a deep calcium and finally leading to a lower uh, final stent expansion coming to thickness as was directly uh, rightly pointed out by dr kathuria that ivs is ivs fails actually here because because of poor uh, the distal acoustic shadowing you may be able to see only the leading edge of the calcium here there is a shadow behind this calcium so you may not be able to assess the thickness while in oct there is a very nice uh, delineation so you can see the anti uh, the forward as well as the backward margin so you are able to assess the thickness of the calcium so oct actually is a, is a winner but what about those people where they, uh, when they have only the ivs in their cath labs so with ivs you can have an idea whether it is a thin or a thick cap a uh, thin cal thin or a thick calcium if you find some reverberation acoustic reverberations behind the uh, leading edge it is an indication that this calcium is actually thin if it is not it can be thin as well as can be thick so having reverberations tells you that it is a thin speck of calcium so to summarize intracoronary imaging is a valuable tool in management of calcified lesions if you rely on cal angiography alone you might underestimate the presence extent severity or depth of the coronary calcium imaging uh, helps uh, correct these abnormalities along with it also helps you plan a tailored strategy according to the amount of calcium and the severity of the calcium it also minimizes the radiation and contrast exposure it helps identify and correct the stent under expansion and malposition thereby improving the long term outcomes of the patients uh, now to just to uh, give an objectivity nowadays an uh, various scores have been developed to assess the severity of the calcium one such score was developed by fujino et al here uh, uh, they rely on three parameters that is the arc if it is more than 180 two points for that if the length the longitudinal length uh, the pullback length if it is more than 5 mm you give it one point thickness which can be assessed only with the oct if it is more than 500 microns or 0.5 mm you give it one point if the score total score is more than 4 it is a harbinger that there will be a poor stent expansion so these uh, lesions with a score of 4 will require ad, uh, advanced treatment for example atherectomy rotational orbital or any one which you prefer or which you have in your lab i'll just come to that now coming to treatment choices what are the treatment choices the treatment choices can be categorized into two groups first is methods to facilitate the lesion crossing as i told you from the difficulties most of the difficulties which arise initially are delivering a device to the location where the calcium is either it can be wire it can be balloon it can be imaging catheter or even a stent so uh, there are methods which facilitate the lesion crossing so i'll just enumerate some of them because these are not specific to calcified lesions i'll go, go into details just to enumerate suppose if you want to deliver a balloon or a stent your guiding is going back what you want to do is increase the guide support it can be done by utilizing a larger side of guide catheter or an active guide catheter with an active support for example a blood catheter if it is not possible you might require, if you have a small side branch you can uh, go there inflate a balloon and utilize anchor balloon technique to increase the guide support there are several extension catheters like mother and child catheter the guide liner guide z line trap liners are available they also deep dive into the artery and increase uh, they straighten the uh, uh, artery course and also provide uh, support up to the point where you want to deliver the uh, device similarly micro catheters and over the bias balloons they also uh, provide support by uh, not allowing the wire to get prolapsed 
you can also trap these microcatheters to uh, have a jailed microcatheter further increasing the support of guide catheters coming to wire cutting a technique it is actually a makeshift approach uh, just a, a on spot uh, score uh, scoring technique where you uh, put a uh, wire aside uh, just aside to a non compliant balloon between uh, non compliant balloon and vessel you put a wire you inflate the non compliant balloon at a higher pressure and you pull back rapidly the wire, second wire thereby cutting the uh, fibrous or the calcified tissue uh, there, thereby creating this name wire cutting technique so i'll now uh, shift my attention to the uh, uh, the uh, other methodologies which are actually specific to fibrocalcific lesions these methodologies actually modify the lesion they can be broadly categorized as either balloon based techniques or atherectomy so balloon based non compliant high pressure balloons balloon granuloplasties balloon granuloplasties are actually desperate attempts if you are not able to deliver something you want to create intentional dissection you take a small size balloon you uh, rupture it uh, uh, by going above the uh, rated balloon uh, burst pressure and it creates a dissection and you can further advance your hardware wire or the microcatheter cutting and scoring balloons intravascular lithotripsy which is the latest addition to this and the other group can be is the atherectomy which actually deals with modifying the lesion they actually reduce the amount of uh, the uh, lesion complexity that is the cal uh, calci calcium namely the rotational orbital and eczema laser atherectomies so i'll come to these one by one so starting with the non compliant balloons most of the times when we are dealing with simple angioplasties we use a semi -compl uh, compliant or a semi compliant balloon to pre dilate the lesions but nowadays it has been realized that it is always better to use a non compliant balloon to pre dilate non compliant balloons have got a flatter compliance chart uh, they have got uniform uh, uh, dilatation thereby causing less chances of uh, spill, uh, uh, rupture and dissections among these uh, uh, low compliance balloons a uh, latest uh, development has been their open nc balloon which is uh, developed by six medical marketed by six medical so it is a very ultra low compliance and it is one of the uh, balloon it is the only one balloon where the rated burst pressure is to the tune of 35 atmosphere this is the uh, rated burst pressure given by manufacturer but in bench studies this balloon has been tested up to 42 atmospheric pressures these atmospheric pressures cannot be uh, reached with the uh, usual in deflators which are available in cath lab they require special in deflators so you can uh, dilate the lesions up to 42 atmosphere if need be otherwise 35 atmospheres most of the times 25 to 30 atmosphere is more than enough it has got as you can see from the lower uh, figure it has got a very flat compliance uh, as compared to other balloons and it could go up to 35 atmospheres with uniform balloon expansion it has uh, in various studies it has successfully treated more than 90% of undilatable lesions compared to a con conventional compliant balloon uh, semi compliant balloon approach because it has got a twin layer technology it is actually a thicker it has got a high crossing profile of 0 0.028 inches so some of the uh, uh, sometimes it may not be able to you may not be able to deliver uh, to the calcified lesion but still its profile is lower than the scoring and cutting balloons this is a study by seco where it ha they have tried to show the efficacy of opian the utilization of opian in various categories like calcific stent optimization and isr lesions you can see there is a, a 20 to 40 percent reduction in residual stenosis so in a nutshell by utilization of opian nc uh, there is an angiographic or technical success of more than 90 percent uh, in this study, there were no coronary perforations or balloon rupture, even at the pressures of 35 to 40. No hosp in hospital or 30 day mace was recorded and no major post procedure bleeding. So, even though it uh, looks quite frightening, but it's very safe. Even if you want to use at uh, the high pressure of 35 to 40 atmospheric pressures. Now, coming to the next uh, lesion modifiable technology that is the cutting balloon namely which is available with the name of flexstone now uh, a newer advanced version has come which is more uh, flexible and more deliverable as compared to flexstone that is the wolverine uh, what happens these are non-compliant balloon with the three or four micro uh, micro blades which are called actually atherotopes these are the blades which have got 0.25 mm in height they are wrapped around uh, they are uh, 
mounted longitudinally on the surface of non compliant balloon and they are actually five times sharper they are real blades and they are five times sharper uh, sharper than the conventional surgical blade and the technique is you gradually inflate them sequentially and slowly initially two atmospheres then four then six you go to two atmosphere count to five then three uh, four six gradually so that the blades actually dip inside the uh, these fibrocalcific lesions and cut them so by dipping into these they uh, cause controlled intermalarial dissections they also got additional benefit of that they, once they are ang they anchor into these uh, lesions and they prevent the water melon seeding so the frequent problem with these uh, the seeding uh, can be avoided you can uh, actually gain a larger luminal gain as compared to the poba especially in case of iato austral lesions here also because it is a balloon based technology with something mounted over it it becomes really bulky and with the uh, uh, blades being there it may not be as deliverable in chaucer's lesions this study actually you can see if uh, non uh, cutting balloons were used in non calcified lesion there was no added advantage but in fibrocalcific lesion there was a luminal gain uh, to the tune of approximately uh, 1 to 2 mm square the cross sectional area significantly increased with the uses of cutting balloon technology especially in those patients where there was evidence of dissection following the cutting balloon so if you want to have a larger luminal gain you might need to see whether there is a controlled dissection present or not so again because these are blades and we have seen that they cause larger luminal gain but it was seen that it didn't uh, transform into any clinical significant clinical benefit the rate of angiographic restenosis at 9 months was uh, no significant uh, no different as compared to a, a normal nc balloon so these are actually reserved for difficult lesions like instant restenosis and arterial lesions where these are very severely fibrotic lesions and in fact these uh, there are some perforations can be seen with these molecules if you go on a very high pressure uh, with these devices so vessel perforation is uh, can happen so now coming to scoring balloon here instead of blades scoring elements which are usually flat uh, uh, rectangular nitinol elements while in angioscope these are actually wrapped into a helical format uh, uh, three nitinol uh, scoring elements are there while in score flex there is one which is stick to the uh, there are two uh, it's a, a dual wire system one is actually attached to the balloon and another wire is the wire over which you take the balloon it a mini rail system so there are two scoring elements above the balloon and you can see there is a 33% gain as compared to semi compliant balloon with the angio sculpt you gain so obviously after the utilization of these scoring balloons you get a uh, proper dilatation of the lesion this is a very interesting uh, catheter the non slip element catheter also called lacrosse catheter it has got three triangular nyl nylon elements it is also scoring uh, so what it a uh, very unique thing about this uh, catheter is that the the scoring elements actually do not uh, are not restricted to the balloon area only they go more distally uh, at least 6 mm forward so there is a area where there uh, is only a scoring element and no balloon so if you dilate the balloon the scoring elements gradually uh, uh, increases uh, dilates and it cuts the dil uh, cuts the calcium or the fibrous tissue uh, this uh, also helps in uh, in the uh, uh, accessing the lesions where which, which are difficult to negotiate by utilizing a technique which is a leopard crawl technique so you push it inside the lesion gradually dilate deflate and push again dilate and deflate this is called as leopard crawl technique and it has been seen that uh, some of the uh, difficult to negotiate lesions can be successfully negotiated now coming to the final part of my topic that is the atherectomy uh, uh, met, uh, atherectomy uh, devices so atherectomy devices have actually gone a uh, major revision over the period of uh, years earlier they you were used as a stand alone debulking therapy that means you debulk a plaque and leave it as such furthermore uh, later on they were used as a bail out technique or adjunct to balloon angioplasties but now the uh, emphasis has shifted to primary intentional plaque modification as it was doctor, uh, quoted by dr sharath if you want to use these devices you should plan it up front the objective is not to uh, vanish the uh, calcium it is actually to reduce the plaque 
to do the plaque modification, you reduce the amount of calcium so that there is a disruption in the continuity of calcium and they become amenable to non-compliant balloon or scoring balloons or cutting balloons. You can dilate the lesions and deliver your stent and other uh, devices. Upfront versus bailout, obviously upfront is, is preferred nowadays because it decreases the fluoroscopic dose, shorter procedural times, lower contrast volume, and use of fewer pre-dilatation balloons, saves time and also the procedural fatigue. Uh, so coming to first arthrectomy, the rotational arthrectomy, because we would be discussing, discussing a lot about this technique, so I would skip in interest of time. It is available with us for more than 30 years. It utilizes the diamond coated bar. Even the international guidelines have cooperated. It has a class 2A indication for uh, heavily calcified lesions. Slow flow can be then can be done nowadays. Uh, a newer Ruta Pro has come. So a lot of hesitation uh, for utilizing uh, this uh, rotational atherectomy can be avoided. Ruta Pro is actually quite uh, uh, handy. The epilation effect of Ruta is not only depends upon, depends upon the bar size, it also depends upon the calcium eccentricity, luminal area, and the intentional guide wire bars, which you want to create. There are two kinds of wire floppy. Usually floppy is used. Extra support wire may be preferred if you want to favorably alter the wire bias or you want to plaque, uh, ablate the plaque at a lesser curvature as compared to greater curvature in ioto lesion to give stability to the bar or if you want to go too deep inside the vessel, distal vessel locations. And not only uh, rota is not uh, uh, after rotational atherectomy, uh, you might uh, couple it with cutting balloons, open NC or lithotripsy as well as if you want to have a complete calcium fractures and create a luminal gain. So this is uh, one of the examples. You can see the luminal gain is not much, but you can see the calcium thickness, which was earlier, has gone considerably down. So the purpose of rotational atherectomy is to reduce the size of calcium, is to thin the calcium so that it is you are able to break it further with the balloons. So Rotex's trial was one where they, uh, they showed more than 90% angiographic and strategic success. But sadly, this success in procedure didn't translate into clinical success. MACE and TLR didn't differ as compared to balloon angioplasty. Similar finding with prepare calc trial. Again, no difference in clinical outcomes. Now coming to second, the orbital electrectomy. It is the technique is more or less similar to the rota uh, rotational electrectomy, but here actually instead of a, cent uh, a central bar, uh, there is an eccentrically mounted crown, and it moves in an ellipt uh, uh, what to say orbital fashion. It was approved in 2013. It comes in only one size. That is a single size, 1.25 millimeters. And good thing about this is rotational atherectomy can be done only with the forward burying. Here you can ablate the tissue in forward as well as backward. So the chances of crown entrapment, which use, which may happen with rotoablation, is very less common. Uh, is usually not seen in orbital atherectomy. If you get stuck, you can come back and ablate the tissue. So you can ablate the tissue going and coming back again. The principle is same, the differential sanding, that means uh, the hard and uh, inelastic tissue is ablated while the soft tissue is left untouched. Only two speeds, so you don't have to look uh, for what, the, what is the speed, you can choose between low speed, that is 80,000 per RPMs uh, or 120,000 RPMs. A higher speed will have a higher orbital force and a larger luminal gain will be there, but this higher speed is usually not needed. Uh, 80,000 is more than sufficient. It, it generates even smaller particles as compared to root ablation. So slow flow, no flow is very less because uh, it moves in elliptical fashion. It is less suitable for ioto lesions because it needs some support to have there. But if there is a, a, a lumen patent, you can go forward and come back, come backwards. So ioto lesions are no, also nowadays done with orbital atherectomy. You can. Uh, so if there is only one size, how can we have different luminal gains? You can increase the uh, rotational speed, decrease the advancement time. That means you move the catheter slowly. So uh, you, there is a increased contact time, increased number of passes, or you can have altered wire bus bias. So you can, by these methods, you can actually increase the luminal gain with orbital atherectomy. Here you can see it was the calcium with the interventional wire bias 
you can see here there is a deep gutter form and the calcium has been ablated utilizing the orbital atherectomy this is the uh, it was tested in several trials orbital 2 is one of the latest so you can see procedural success around 90 percent successful stentillary more than 97 percent and less than 50 percent residual stenosis in 98 percent freedom from maze was 90 percent Overall maze was for in one year was 16% and deaths in 3.2% TLR and TVR approximately 6%. As compared to this, this is a comparison uh, by Kinney et al. They compared 10, 10 patients in each group as compared to rotational atherectomy. Orbital atherectomy actually caused deeper and longer cuts. It ultimately led to better uh, stent opposition and expansion. But again, if you look at the clinical endpoints, both of the techniques, rotational as well as orbital atherectomy, they are more or less similar. No significant difference in death, MIR, TLR, TVRs. If you talk about safety, because it causes more uh, larger gutters and larger cuts, device induced perforations are actually more common in or orbital atherectomy. So rotational atherectomy can be considered safer in this uh, term. Coming to again uh, the next modality, that is the eczema laser. It is one of the uh, recent introductions in atherectomy. Uh, it is uh, made by uh, Philips as CVX300 system, Usually, utilizes xenon chloride gas to produce a light in UV range, 308 nanometer wavelength. It is a cool laser light with a very small penetration depth of 30 to 50. So it limits the media and adventitial damage. It only uh, uh, damages or ablates the uh, thing which it comes into contact with. So you can't, you don't expect uh, deeper cuts. So it is very safe. The various principles it utilizes is photochemical, photomechanical, and photothermal. For thrombus and fibrotic tissue, it is mainly photochemical and photothermal. For calcium, it is actually by photomechanical. What what do we mean by photomechanical? Laser actually interacts with the fluid, causes bubbles to evaporate, and these bubbles rupture creating mechanical disruptions into the nearby calcium. So photomechanical is the major mechanism by which it actually uh, does the calcium atherectomy. It is available in four size. Point 0.9 is actually the most common one which is used by uh, selecting. the. We usually select a catheter size to vessel reference vessel size as 0.5 to 0.6. The most common catheter which is 0.9, it utilizes a fluence of 80 and a repetition rate of 80 hertz. While doing this, the dictum is when you are about to ablate, start the ablation, you have to do a simultaneous saline infusion because it is the saline which generates the bubbles. Blood can even generate bubbles, but that will lead to even larger damage. But if you want to have even larger damage, you would try to inject a contrast. So saline followed by blood followed by contrast with increasing uh, damage or increasing uh, effectiveness of atherectomy. For resistant lesions, obviously this uh, method can be intentionally utilized. Ideally, it should not be done. It is risky, but if there is a resistant lesion, you might uh, give a small contrast bolus to augment the laser efficacy. Sometimes there may be circumstances where microcatheter or nothing goes beyond, so you might put it aside the catheter and burn, creating a pilot hole. And with this a hole, you can pass other, widen the hole and you can create, uh, you can pass other uh, paraphernalia. Usually uh, it is a bailout strategy, especially when the lesions are uncrossable with dedicated balloons, or if you want to have a, uh, you want to go for ro uh, rotational or orbital atherectomy, but you are not able to pass the microcatheters. It has been usually reserved for calcified instant restenosis lesions. As I told you, the major mechanism of this is photomechanical. It is usually more suited to moderate calcium. For severe calcium, at additional atherectomy devices might be needed. For example, rotational or lithotripsy. And uh, the usual drawback is uh, its limited availability. So it, just to have a comparison, uh, most of them, these uh, three atherectomy uh, uh, devices are actually comparable. Comparable For non-crossable lesions, any of these can be utilized. For non-dilatable lesions, rotablation actually wins. For eccentric calcium, because it uh, uh, does uh, eccentric uh, centri with a uh, centrifugal force, orbital atherectomy is actually preferred. 
rapid exchange system elka is actually a rapid exchange system while root ablation and the orbital arthrectomy they are actually uh, over the wire technique so it usually require two people at least initially um, all of them can be utilized uh, done through a six french guiding if there is a under expanded strand while well, ideally this should not happen you should pre dilate the lesion first before uh, putting a stent but sometimes you get stuck with an ex under expanded stent in this either you ablate the stent you do a stent ablation with the rotational arthrectomy or you utilize the photomechanical effect of elka beyond uh, to uh, uh, this uh, dissolve the uh, uh, calcium beyond the uh, stent uh, this is uh, now going to the last modality which is the intravascular lithotripsy it is actually a balloon based but because it is latest addition to our calcium management strategy it has been uh, recently approved in 2017 Uh, so it is actually utilizes the lithotripsy mechanism uh, by giving a pulsatile mechanical energy it breaks the calcium into smaller pieces uh, it utilizes a semi compliant balloon the balloon is inflated so that the uh, balloon wall is actually in touch with the calcified lesion that there are lithotripsy emitters uh, they actually generate uh, the electrical they convert the electrical energy into a caustic pulse energy thereby creating a 50 atmospheric effective pressure and fracture superficial as well as deep calcium so uh, uh, affecting the deep calcium is one of the virtues of intravascular lithotripsy so one of the few modalities uh, for deep calcium is actually the lithotripsy so because it is a balloon based so there is only a short learning curve you don't need additional training uh, you can just go there uh, there is a short console so you don't need additional space also because it only breaks the calcium doesn't grind or sand so there are no microemboli so chances of soil flow no flow are very less because of large obviously because as i told you balloon based catheters sometimes have a large crossing profile so they may need for pre dilatation or arthrectomy prior to utilizing this approach one of the uh, features is shock topics whenever you give these myocardium can capture these uh, pulse energies and uh, demonstrate short runs of non sustained ven ventricular tachycardia there may be a small dip in the pressures but uh, sustained arrhythmia is not there as you can see here a post ivl you can see in this picture middle one calcium breaks having a calcium break document if you can document calcium breaks this is a, a surrogate marker of a higher uh, final um, uh, msa disrupt cad again it showed a very uh, successful pr uh, promising acute gain was 1.7 finds a uh, fine final instant rate total stenosis was uh, 11.9 you can see perforations and major dissections are very rare so quite safe but the limitations the large crossing profile costly soft topics shock topics can be there if the patient has got pacemaker can interfere with this sometimes balloon can rupture if there is a solid nodule solid calcium nodules so it is less utilize uh, less useful in solid calcium nodules so the, apart Pravesh, from these you can some Pravesh, may i gently request you to just, right. just two two, two yeah. i guess two sure. or three thank slides you. thank you yeah so you can have combination of strategies for example rota tripsy it is a hybrid drill and disrupt, uh, disrupt you utilize rota ablation to create a channel and then you utilize lithotripsy to break the deep calcium or you can use razor which is a combination of laser followed by uh, rota ablation here you uh, utilize uh, elka laser to facilitate the passage for microcatheters and wire and exchange the wire with the uh, rota wire and then complete the rota ablation this is a comparison i would skip this so uh, dr garo has already uh, showed this but just to emphasize whenever you see a calcium don't think in terms of intervention not all calcific lesions require intervention first assess the functional significance if there is a functional significance either by invasive or non invasive test then only you subject them to some kind of management strategies and not all these patients will go for percutaneous strategies some of them like left main with, uh, with those with the left main disease three vessel or higher simplex score or diabetic or poor ejection fraction they will be a better uh, they will be more uh, suitable for surgery or cabg rest others will go into pci where things start with the angiographic classification for mild you can have a test of compliance with the balloon pre dilatation if gets dilated go ahead if it doesn't get dilated go for lithotripsy or rotablation 
for moderate and severe calcification it is better that you utilize angiograph uh, imaging guidance again as i showed you scoring is required if the score is higher side 3 to 5 you utilize lithotripsy if it is on a lower side you can try a, no, a dilatation with a non compliant or open nc balloons there may be certain lesions where you might not be able to pass anything or imaging catheter or even balloons non crossable lesions there you you are left with the rotor ablation or orbital atherectomy alone again after you have done with the intervention the atherectomy it is important that you document the optimal result by optimal result i mean to see say that you have reduced the calcium amount and you have documented the calcium fractures because that means you are calcium fracture means you are going to get a large luminal gain in the end no randomized control trials have directly compared different atherectomy techniques so there is no way to find out where you want to uh, where you can uh, Uh, there is no uh, trial to suggest you that this is the patient population where this uh, atherectomy device will work the best but this choice uh, should be considered based upon patient and angiographic character characteristics local availabilities operator comfort and institutional expertise remember the principal objective is to ensure adequate lesion preparation regardless of the device utilized so lesion preparation is actually the target rather than the device just to give an idea orbital atherectomy it is easy to use single size device you don't need to upgrade you get a larger vessel without upsizing the crown just by varying the speed and your movement speed elka usually for proximal cap modification ivl plug modification even with the wire inside branch deep calcification while with the atherectomy devices it is not possible to have wire in the side branch rotor ablation is usually considered gold uh, standard for atherectomy it has got a very high penetrating power at the tip of the bar so it can be utilized where you cannot pass any device it can ablate osteal ctos isr and if you are very aggressive you can do a stent ablation you can even cut the stent struts just to end intravascular imaging and adequate lesion preparation are the key to success thank you thank you dr pravesh for this i have been mean, excellent and exhaustive lecture and whatever ignorance we had about calcium you have debunked all the ignorant lesions so now our flow is to me 3 regarding knowledge of uh, you can say calcium and and all those things so i think uh, there is a question in the chat box which i would like you to answer uh, dr sandeep wants to know what is the technical difference between a scoring balloon and a cutting balloon i mean with respect to structure and with respect to efficacy okay so basically uh, if you talk about structure the cutting balloons have actually got the as the name suggests cutting balloons have got blades they so cut sorry so they are actually got blades over the balloon so and these balloons are actually longitudinally placed and when it is wrapped when a balloon is in deflated position it is somehow wrapped so that the balloons hide inside the uh, ball, uh the balloon uh, te- uh, the uh, balloon material so they are not exposed so once you take there is slowly and gradually inflate so that the balloon gradually opens up and the blades come into view they go and cause intimal and medial tears so these are the very sharp blades you can expect that these are five times sharper than the surgical blade so you can expect what these must be doing to the inside fibrocalcific lesions so they go and cut these lesions they cause controlled intimal dissections as opposed to these the uh, scoring balloons what they have they have got rectangular rectangular scoring elements wrapped over the balloon so whatever the pressure when you inflate a balloon the pressure exerted by your indeflator is uniformly distributed over the surface of balloon so once there is a scoring element what happens if there are two scoring elements or three scoring elements pressure of this 10 atmospheres or 12 atmosphere these are distributed only to these three scoring elements and these put pressure so see this is like a focused force dilatation they don't cut but they just break these calciums into fragments and you may be able to further post direct with a non compliant balloon followed by this and you will achieve a larger luminal gain so uh, efficacy wise what is your choice I mean, just, just a second thing. can i add on to this something yeah a little yeah, difference between a scoring and a cutting will be the 
the basic thing will be that the scoring balloon is much more compl- both of them are semi compliant but the scoring balloon is much more the crossing profile is better so this is one players where scoring balloon scores over the cutting balloon again because it is a it's on a semi compliant balloon the scoring balloon is always semi compliant balloon the size is available are higher you can have size from 2 to 5 the length also available is high 10 to 20 while in a cutting balloon the difference is that on a semi it's not a particularly semi it's on a non compliant balloon so the profile of the balloon is much harder so if you have a lesion where the cutting is not crossing scoring might cross again the sizes are only from 2 to 4 in this case and they don't go beyond 15 so the profile of the balloon with respect to scoring and cutting the basic difference is on being a semi compliant balloon scoring scores over the cutting if you are not able to really cross the cutting okay, okay. And, and does the newer wolverine version i think as i believe it's it has a lower crossing profile i think they have reduced the uh, i think the adhesive material uh, length so that the crossing profile is is better than the previous cutting version so but your point is well taken Uh, I think there is sure. another question uh, from the audience. Uh, I think Dr. Gaurav is there. He can take up this, or I think any any uh, doctor is she or so he asks that between a, a arc of 90 degree and 180 degree, can cutting balloon be used in place of rota? I mean, there is always a tendency to avoid the rota. So between an arc of 90 to 180, can we do away with the rota and just do away with the cutting balloon? I think uh, the choice uh, would be better here would be opn balloon rather uh, choosing a cutting balloon because mainly cutting and scoring balloon are primary mainly for fibrotic lesions although we often use in then calcified lesions but i think opn would be a better choice over here and if the delivery is the problem and of course the rotablation would help okay that's a good answer so there is yeah. a good news for the beginners i think uh, abbot has launched a new ultrion oct system or oct algorithm it's a artificial intelligence based uh, oct algorithm which will give you the arc and the thickness which dr gaurav highlighted and dr sharachandra also said that the arc it will automatically quantify the arc and it will automatically give you the thickness so that you can use the score which dr pravesh said or the arc method which dr gaurav uh, uh, highlighted upon so that's a good news for the beginners and even for us i mean after the assessment it gives you the entire arc length thickness all those things I don't know. I, I I think it was first unveiled in the Euro PCR. I don't we, we don't have the first hand experience, but it will be an interesting. I think I'll go. Once again, with an opium balloon, you will have to be careful with some things. Like you can't use a polymer sleeve bar with that. You will have to make sure that you use an extra support bar with that. You will have to make sure that you are taking a balloon which is at least 0.5 millimeter less than the, than the artery itself. These are some of the prerequisites to start to clear with the opium. Whenever you are in a case. You are not thinking about them. You are scoring, and a cutting balloon is like a routine work which you are doing, because you are using field directive bars so commonly. So, open balloon, because I have personally experienced this, using it on a whisper wire, the balloon got stuck completely stuck up, and it never inflated. So that thing which they have written that don't use a polymer sleeve wire, don't use an extra, don't do it without an extra support wire. You have must st- make sure that you do very serial dilatations. Don't go above twenty straight away. Just take some time. All these things have to be kept in mind when you're doing OPM because you're bypassing a very important technique, and you just can't be comparing a scoring or cutting with the OPM. OPM is something which has come up new. Might do the job same, but in a nail, uh, mill of nail case where you're just flowing with the case, OPM will make you have to make sure that you keep your other modalities in your mind as well as keep everything open. What you are handling right. So opn is something where you will get used to it but you are not used to it straight away thank you dr sanjeev thank you dr gaurav thank you dr pravesh so as dr pravesh rightly pointed out all about all the modalities of calcium these all modalities are available in india except orbital lithotomy this will be available in short time it is delayed because of covid and i would like to invite our next speaker dr rishi sethi uh, Dr. Sharad, Dr. Sharad, there has been a little change in the sequence of the program. Okay. Uh, I, I think uh, let's welcome Dr. Menon from Mumbai. He has joined us, a, a very, very senior and an expert operator for all these. Um, uh, uh, you know, for for every case, we have seen him uh, perform. We have interacted with him in most of uh, the meetings, and 
let me assure you that he is the person who probably has a tremendous amount of experience in both imaging as well as the rotor ablation technique. But before we move, so we uh, unfortunately he has to leave early. So we have pre-poned his talk and he will be speaking now. But before that, I think um, it was a very, very interesting lecture that uh, although uh, we overstepped the time, but I'm sorry I had to interrupt you. But I think it was very, very exhaustive lecture with Dr. Pravesh took in which we, we learned that together about all the modalities. And before we step forward, um, and rather than keeping all these modalities of uh, no, plaque modification into one basket, uh, based upon lesion, if I may ask Dr. Menon first and then followed by Dr. Ranjan Shetty and learn from their experience. If we divide these techniques of plaque debulking between balloons, various types of balloons, cutting balloons, opium, laser, uh, both the atrectomies, and we try to classify according to the type of case, let's say, uh, just a superficial calcium, superficial plus deep calcium, or a scenario in which there is predominant fibrosis, in which there is a moderate calcification. So how do we decide which technique to choose when in terms of the location of calcium and in terms of the amount of calcium vis-a-vis -vis its, its, uh, its plaque, um, its con composition in terms of a fibrofat plaque? Uh, why I ask this question is that, uh, you know, we have been talking about flex tomes and laser, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that flex tome uh, would actually be contraindicated in a heavily calcified lesion because the blade would get stuck in the calcification and there is a chance that you will end up blades being left behind in the arteries. So uh, it is more for a fibrocalcified lesion with not more than a moderate degree of calcification. The similar issue is with laser. You can't you can't replace rotor ablation with laser. So in terms of putting all these techniques into correct perspective, what do you think, how do you decide between superficial calcium, superficial plus deep calcium, and a fibrocalcific lesion of a moderate degree of calcification? What runs in your mind? We would like to know, so for the benefit of everyone. Dr. Menon first, and then Dr. Ranjan Shetty. Uh, first, first of all, uh, Dr. Sethi, thank you very much. Dr. Sharad Chandra, Dr. Sethi, thank you very much for having, having me over, and it's, it's a privilege. Uh, thanks a lot. Now, it, it, that's, uh, if, if, I may, if I can share one slide with you, I, will, I, can, I can explain to you, uh, you know, the, the modalities of how we uh, select what sort of... Uh, uh, one second, I'll just try and share this. So uh, this is this is a um, this this is a slide basically on the um, on, on on the lesion. I mean, on how do you classify um, calcium content on a, on on a coronary angiogram, and what do you what do you choose uh, when when you uh, choose the different modalities of treatment? So um, depending upon th there's one way of imaging it that if you have I mean if you have a situation where uh, an imaging catheter cannot cross the lesion, then of course you're stuck with only either of these two options, that's either a rotational atherectomy or an orobital atherectomy in, in most of these patients. Because if an imaging catheter cannot cross, it's very unlikely that any of the other the, the, the other uh, ima uh, catheters or balloons will cross these lesions, especially when you're looking at uh, a, a scoring balloon or a cutting balloon or an opium balloon, all of which are bulky catheters as compared to the regular non-compliant catheters. Uh, and when we have this, um, sorry, um, when we have a situation like this, we don't want to mess around with the lesion in case you're going around, going ahead with the rotational atherectomy. So it's always uh, it's always uh, 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 right that you choose uh, one of the atherectomy procedures, and when when you have a situation where you find it difficult to cross even the smallest balloon, or you try to cross an imaging catheter and it's it's not possible to cross. Now, if you can cross an imaging and, and a catheter. Uh, or if you can I mean, use a predilatation and then define what is the score of calcium, depending upon the calcium arc of more than 180 degrees, calcium length of more than 5 millimeters, calcium thickness of more than 5.5 millimeters. Uh, if, if, if that is so, and there's significant, that means there's a significant amount of deep calcium, then of course you either go for a very high pressure balloon or you go in for a lithoplasty balloon. If there's no significant deep calcium, it's more of superficial calcium, 
then and the arc is more than 180 degrees the length is more than point is 5, 5 mm thickness is more than 50 fine and fine microns then of course you go in for a rotational laparectomy and then use a balloon uh, optimal balloon expansion in these patients if these these three parameters are not uh, uh, you know, are, are not there you can always use a non compliant balloon or a cutting or score a scoring balloon get an optimal expansion if you can't get it again you have the option of a lithoplasty balloon today and then of course go in and deploy the stent and then look at the uh, malle position and uh, stent ex under expansion a simpler way of seeing it is based again on i mean if you, i'm i'm going to talk about based, basing it on on, on an oct based based upon whether it is deep superficial or nodular calcium if it is deep calcium no superficial nothing no no nodular calcium you can use a nc scoring or cutting balloon and then go into the stent uh if there is a it's a superficial calcium and the score is 1 to 3 you can go it still go it at the uh, one of the scoring or cutting balloons if the score is very high again like what i said more than 180 degree r more than 5 mm long more than 0.5 mm thick depending on whether whether it is balloon crossable uncrossable you can either use an ivl or you can go use a rotational laparectomy or an orbital laparectomy and measure the calcium fracture on oct before you go ahead and deploy the stent the other situation is if you have a significant nodular calcium then the triple of choice still remains rotational laparectomy or orbital laparectomy none of your cutting balloons or your or or your ivl balloons or your um, uh, uh, scoring balloons will or, or high high pressure balloons will give you an optimal result when there's pure nodular calcium so i and of course like i said non crossable lesions then uh, you have the uh, uh, rotational laparectomy as the uh, triple of choice so i hope i have been able to throw some light on this uh, in terms of the uh, uh, modalities that are available uh, and how you choose uh, one of the modalities over the other in terms of uh, treatment of these uh, lesions no I, i believe it was perfect and we completely agree with whatever you have said it, it, if you make decisions on on the basis of how you have explained on this flow chart methodology then we really end up selecting the best the uh, uh, best technique for uh, that particular case and that is really important and when we combine this with the, all the knowledge which dr pravesh has given us and we uh, end up making otherwise you know when you are on the table and you don't have this structure flow in mind and you you see a calcified lesion you would just go for whatever is available whatever you are comfortable with but that would probably not be the correct thing for the patient in long term just one clarification i would seek from you here is that when we say uh, in your second slide when we say that the the calcium the calcium arc is more than 180 degrees and uh, it's more than 5 mm 5 cm 5 mm in length and depth so uh, 0.5 mm in depth then uh, you say if it's balloon crossable then you would prefer ivl so are you equating ivl to a rotor ablation system here i mean even if it's a balloon balloon crossable lesion uh would you prefer a rotor ablation or you would just preferentially go towards ivl i mean are we supposed to place ivl and rotor ablation at the same level uh, that's what my question to you is well i mean if you if you if you look at uh, a lot of studies that are shown i mean that that have been presented and cases that have been presented ivl has now i mean they they are trying to place ivl as as an option to uh, rotor ablation in fact uh, in one of the centers it with uh, florent kukili in uh, italy uh, he uses opian balloons um, in place of rotor ablation he says i don't use a rotor ablator at all uh, most of the cases that i do are purely in opian balloons But of course for us i think rotablet is still a treatment of choice in in most of these patients um uh, litho lithoplasty is i i, I think is uh, probably limited to very few patients who can really afford the procedure and uh, it's not easy to cross that uh, to, to get the balloon across most of these lesions so crossing these lesions is going to be something which uh, is is extremely difficult and i think rotablet scores over most of these uh, devices um, uh, and, and, and under those circumstances and i think um, Uh, knowledge of how to use a rotor blader is today very essential especially when we are dealing with complex anatomies and we are looking at uh, you know uh, uh, multi mul multiple stents multi vessel pci where we need optimal stent uh, expansion and deployment so let me bring dr ranjan shetty and let me put a pointed you know i mean most of the things that have been explained by dr menon so i would like to uh, put a pointed question at you a little provocative question many a times we hear that opian nc you know is like a balloon rotor ablation technique and we there's, there's a new excitement 
with every new technology that comes and now it's uh, the lithotripsy and laser let's let's forget the laser for the time being and let's focus on opnnc lithotripsy and rotablation in terms of the pure efficacy many a times we fall on these simpler techniques of lithotripsy and uh, opnnc because there is a there is a steep learning curve and we don't really want to but in your opinion between the opnnc the three techniques of opnnc uh, the lithotripsy and rotablation which do you think will uh, have better efficacy in a in a arc calcium of more than 180 degrees and uh, deep calcium and a long calcium yeah thank you thank you dr rishi and uh, dr jit uh, beautifully presented and i would totally agree with your points but just i think since this is a very pointed question in terms of efficacy actually i will should be the most efficacious if we can cross it so the whole point is i will is efficacious both for superficial and deep and just coming back to your previous question wherever there are superficial calcium we need to assume that there are deeper calcium it's very unlikely that it is just superficial rota does a wonderful job in crossing it one does a wonderful job in um, you know uh, modulating the uh, plaque but then the final stent expansion that may not be achieved just by rota because you're just burying nowadays with 1.5 that's the courageous people others are just trying with 1.25 nobody goes to 2 nobody goes to you know anything higher so we should understand rota is to facilitate rest of the therapy and that's how it should be because that makes it very safer but once you facilitate the final outcome may not be totally decided so we need to optimize the rota result using minimum what you need to do is a non compliant balloon most of the time you may have to go to a uh, opn balloon but as dr ajit uh, uh, dr menon has beautifully put it if it is crossable then i will will be the best because it would tackle both superficial and deep calcium and post ivl the stent outcome the uh, final uh, this one will be the best with that yes great 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 to hear that yeah. dr um, devender and dr devender has been silent let's bring him in and dr just a single what would be your do you agree with everything that has been said till now or do you have a different opinion and dr kathuria who of course has a lot of experience and and uh, dr kathuria or dr devender do you have any comments on this topic yeah, yeah we totally on? i totally agree with uh, i have more experience with rota ablation rather than uh, lithotripsy actually few cases were done but not so many cases but i feel the both are complementary with each other many times uh, if uh, we are not able to pass the lithotripsy balloon we can do rota ablation and then can pass if the results are not very good so, and uh, again the open balloon it is uh, again important uh, particularly if uh, the reason is very tight it is not uh, like uh, it is very hard which is not openable with the uh, routine balloons definitely right uh, uh, so rishi i uh, my notion is very clear about one thing most of the things can be done with the rota if the wire bias is not there even a deep calcium is mildly affected by rota but per se for a deep calcium ivl and the scoring balloons and the cutting balloon score much higher while for a superficial calcium the rota does the job but yes you are absolutely correct there is no nothing like just being a superficial calcium but if you have a rota wire which is not having a bias you have a calcium you are, you are able to rotate your rota bar most of the time it will take care of the lesion of course if you have very deep calcium present which you have already documented with an oct then of course i will will supplement but yes non crossable lesion first thing to be done if you have modal multiple modalities then you can choose between ivl and rota yes but i would say rota is something which should be on the shelf which will solve 90% of the problem show sure. so um so why so dr devender you said wanted to say something yeah 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 in few of the cases uh, which were sent to me uh, like for doing rota ablation there was uh, angiographically deep uh, sort of dense calcification was there but when we did uh, imaging in such cases like i was and uh, we found that it is only it was on the uh, deep calcific calcium only and we did uh, just like routine angioplasty and the successful uh, angioplasty was done just uh, because of imaging with the help of imaging means if there is deep calcification no superficial calcification we can after imaging can directly go with the routine angioplasty and taking uh, like high pressure balloon dilatation and it gives good results so imaging is important 
yeah so why i wanted to you know spend a little more, despite the fact that we are running late i wanted to spend a little more time on this issue because uh it's a webinar of road ablation master class we do not want uh, do not want the audience to go back with with just the technique and not the concepts and as you were saying as i mean uh, you you talked about the deep calcification where you did not use any of the techniques as dr pravesh was saying that just seeing calcium does not mean we are going to we are compelled we are we are uh, to use one technique or the other so uh, the fact is that which technique to use in which case is very important decision and our point of this master class and the further further uh, interaction that you will have on rotor ablation is that your decision in a one particular case to intervene on calcium should be based upon solid science and not based upon the fact that we are uncomfortable with doing road ablation as dr kathuria was saying we must have it on the shelf we must have the skill whether to use it or not in one particular case or not is important so that decision will only come when you are proficient in road ablation system if you do not have that skill then of course you will have to bank on the other system and they might that might not be the correct strategy in a patient so that's what the whole concept you must have all the techniques available with you you must have the skill and then make the rational decision as dr menon and dr um dr reddy have uh, you know brilliantly dr shetty sorry had brilliantly pointed out so uh, may i just now invite dr menon for his talk and we we would love to hear what he has to say about the indication the contraindication case selection of uh, of rotor ablation over to you sir yeah. <coughs> thank you sir thank thank you dr rishi uh, i my my talk is on uh, basically I'll, i'll keep it very short and uh, Uh, in, in the interest of time, basically on uh, indications, contraindications, and, and and what, how do you select cases? Uh, what are the points to look at in terms of selecting cases, especially when you're starting off with a uh, with with, with uh, using rotor bladers? Uh, very few will know that uh, today Boston Scientific man uh, markets uh, the rotor blader, but it was uh, it, it used to be it was David Auth. who first got the rotor blader i mean who sort of designed the rotor blader and uh, in 1992 or 91 towards the end of the end of 1991 when rotor bladers came into india it used to be marketed by uh, man it used to be from david auth so um, of course i'm going to skip these slides we know that uh, coronary I mean, calcification prevalence is extremely high and you, and very often when you do a procedure you get stuck in the middle of a procedure of a seemingly normal procedure with a non expansible non expansible lesion and that's where uh, you always get stuck uh, in, in in these patients and uh, like has been spoken in the earlier slides in, in by the earlier speaker we know that cal uh, cal calcium means a higher mace rate a higher tbr higher cardiac death higher mi and even in patients with acute coronary syndrome mind you presence and presence of calcium is quite significant in a, in 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 a lot, a lot of these series and whether you use the regulating stents or not the recurrent episodes that may uh, target vascular vessel, vessel revascularizations um, and uh, tlfs are, are extremely high and um, so how do we approach calcified coronary disease like i said in the previous slides you have various methods today and our to- our, our uh, the topic today is basically based upon on rota- the use of rotational arthrectomy um intravascular the use of intravascular ultrasound and intra coronary ct has improved the definition of calcium and and that puts us in a bit of a spot when we see when we, what we what what the mind doesn't see we, we don't bother about too much but when we see something then it becomes op- imperative on us to act on it and treat it and that's where rotavision in, in comes up in most of these calcific lesions so what do you say what would you say are the indications of uh, of of rotavision Uh, if you look at the standard classical in, in, in indications it can be it's 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 a, the system which can be used as a sole therapy or with adjunctive balloon angioplasty and is indicated in patients with coronary artery disease mind you who are acceptable candidates for coronary artery bypass graft surgery this is something which you need to be will be to be aware of especially from the uh, from uh, from certain points of view that these patients should be acceptable acceptable candidates for cabg also and who meet one of the following selection criteria one is a single vessel atherosclerotic coronary disease with a stenosis that can be passed to the guide wire multiple vessel coronary artery disease that in a physician's judgment does not pose undue risk to the patient certain patients who have had prior percutaneous transfer angioplasty and have a risk notic uh, with especially with a uh, Uh, a calcified uh, new atherosclerosis in the native vessel 
on a native vessel atherosclerotic coronary artery disease that is less than 25 millimeters in length. Having said that, um, previously when, when it was first taken out as an indication, it used to be, it, the, the use, it's used in, in uh, graphs was quite, uh, was, was relatively, was quite contraindicated. Today, it is a relative contraindication. You cannot use it in a lima graph. Please do not try to use it through a lima graph because once the lima goes into spasm, and you have a situation where the burr is caught, you, you may find it damn difficult to extract it out of the, uh, out of the, out of the vessel. And uh, you may use it in certain selective vein grafts when there is a new atherosclerotic disease of the vein graft and you have calcification in those vessels. It may be used with an extreme degree of caution, though it is still not, an, an not, not, not a classical indication. Certain precautions, pre -preca what precautions do you take in, when in treating these patients? Certain types of lesions, locations of lesions and patients with certain conditions, uh, they, they, they have an inherently higher risk uh, in, in, in these patients. And for these, for many of these applications, uh, very few cases have been done uh, using the rotability, the rotability system. And of course, patients are not, not candidates for, for, for coronary bypass graft surgery because if anything goes wrong with you during the procedure, you may, you may, not, you, you may land up with issues. But today, with the, with the advent of, of newer uh, stents, newer techniques, this has become a relatively a lesser, a lesser of an issue. Uh, patients with, un I mean, again, this is, these are earlier slides, so unprotected left vein coronary disease was a relative contraindication or uh, to, to, to be, or it was supposed to be used with precaution because once you have a slow flow in a left main, uh, in, 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 a, in a left main with a, a rotablator, it can be a bit of an issue. Uh, again, remember patients with dejection, dejection fraction less than 30% is still a relative contraindication. Long lesions, again, a relative contraindications. Highly angulated lesions, again, a relative contraindications because, like has been spoken earlier, you talk about the guide wire bias. Now, if the, if the guide wire bias when in angulated lesions is towards the side of the normal vessel, especially if it's not a concentric calcium, it's an eccentric calcium, unless you change the bias of the wire, which is not so easy for beginners, if you have if you have an extremely angulated lesion, be careful when you burr, especially uh, when, when the wire bias is towards the normal segment of the vessel, because then perforations are much higher. Um, if you have, I mean, if, I mean, especially when you're dealing with uh, with with osteo circumflex lesions, when you're dealing with uh, uh, osteo diagonal lesions or acute angle takeoffs of the obtuse marginals, be careful to when you look at the bias of the wire. Do not do not let the wire bias take the vessel, take the burr onto the normal side of the vessel, which can be a bit of a problem. Uh, now, uh, a lot of people say that you do not require pacing leads. We, as a rule, especially when we use it in the right coronary artery and in the circumflex, especially if it's a co-dominant circumflex or if you have a nodal branch arising out of the circumflex, temporary pacing lead would be necessary. And it is much more safer to use a balloon tipped temporary pacing lead uh, to can, can keep in position so that once you have bradycardia during an episode, you are not undoubtedly, you, you don't have to uh, panic, you don't have to um, get the burr back and you don't have to get into a situation where you stop burring, the pacemaker takes over and you can complete your complete that run of burring before you stop it. So it, it does help you when you have a temporary pacing, when you have a temporary pacing lead uh, in, in, in these positions. There have been situations where, and there have been studies where they've said that using the burr, burning at slower speeds may reduce the incidence of bradic, bra, bra, bradycardias or may reduce the incidence of temporary uh, temporary complete heart blocks. But in real world practice, uh, I have not seen that so much. I mean, right coronary artery, is, uh, we still deal with almost 70 to 85% of the patients ending up with some form of significant bradycardia or temporary complete heart blocks, which revert, of course, in a, in a matter of a few, in a, in a minute or so. But that that, but that minute, that, that 15 seconds, 30 seconds of time, uh, it, it gives you the extra amount of time you can burr and complete the, the, the run before we uh, uh, before stop burning. The use a rotability system should be always be carried in hospitals where you, if you if you need need to, you have an emergency bypass can be performed in case there is a significant perforation or a situation which you cannot handle on the table using all your uh, all, all your devices that are at your at your disposal 
what are the contraindications absolutely contraindications are patients where a guide wire will not pass of course uh, now we have started doing um, rotabilities in in in, in, in chronic total occlusions but again once we once a wire passes saphenous vein grafts last remaining vessel with compromised lv function again these are these are uh, now i i can say that with the advent of newer techniques they fall to relative contraindications thrombus is one of the significantly uh, understandable uh, contraindications to the use of rotablator i'll show you one of the films where we used it with in, in a, where we had to use it in a patient with recent with with a, with a recent mi uh, angiographic evidence of serious significant dissection of the treatment site is also a relative contraindication and uh, you may have to wait for the for the dissection to heal before treating the lesion with the rotablator system now if you go to select patient criteria when you when you start learning the the, the disease the least difficult lesion to treat would be one that is less than 10 mm not a large amount of calcium a straight vessel lv function 50% good distal runoff and a raised notic lesion so these are the these are the least difficult lesions that you can treat uh, when you when you starting off with a with, with doing rotablators a little more difficult lesion is more than 10 mm or more mild tortuosity tapering vessel mild eccentricity and an lv function which is less than 40% and when you deal with the most difficult lesions these are the ones which are long lesions heavily calcific significantly tapered vessels the distally highly eccentric lesions reduced lv function which is a segmental and or global now why a tapered distal vessel i'm sure that in the next few talks we'll touch upon those the importance of burring slowly the importance of not letting the wire the the, the burr get on to the distal end of the wire and of course the the the, the significant the, the significance of tear off of burring uh, beyond the lesion and not letting the wire the the, the burr jump into a tapered vessel which can cause significant uh, uh, disrupted uh, dissection though this works in the principle of differential cutting where there's a wire bias towards a normal vessel you that it, it may still damage that vessel in respect to the fact that it is said that this does not cut normal tissue it cuts only uh, cal cal calcific plaques um i'm not going to uh, 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 talk on this much because it's been taken in the next few talks but again uh, there was a, there, there, there were, uh, coming to the point on how do you select a burr for an angioplasty again it's also based upon the case selection it is based upon the fact that are you going to use the burr as a final destination therapy or are you using a burr just to minimize or maximize well, uh, the, the 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 modification of the plug so if you're going to use a burr just to modify the plug and then use then you're going to use a lithotripsy balloon or a high pressure balloon to uh, get a to, to to open up the artery your burr ratio can be about 0.6 to 0.7 but if you're going to use a burr as a final destination therapy to get an optimal sensing and not you're not planning on using a ultra high pressure balloon or a lithoplasty balloon you're going to use a normal high pressure balloon you can use a burr ratio of up to points probably 0.7 to 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 0.85 mind you that does have a higher potential for injury so you need to be careful when you upsize your burr from a uh, 1.5 to a 1.75 to a 2 and it also determines what sort of a guiding you're going to use in in in, in these patients because uh, when you use a um, uh, uh, you need to understand that the minimal diameter that you require for a 2 mm burr is a 0.83 that means you require an 8 french guiding catheter for using a 2 mm burr whereas a 1.25 can easily go through a 6 french um, um, uh, or less guiding catheter so you the size of when, so when you use a, any of these burrs when you using when you plan a procedure use a guiding catheter based upon what size you're going to look at so that's 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 what that's what i need to talk about case selection um also um again uh, please under uh, 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 just take care of this pneumonium draw you need a drip saline drip from the bottom of the advancer check that the burr is rotating outside and that the rotate the rpms are stable use the advancer to make sure that the fidus free movement of the advancer knob and make sure that the wire is always visible throughout the procedure you you need to take care of the distal wire 
because the distal wire is a very very is, is is very flimsy and has a chance of getting caught in smaller vessels and you may strip the entire vessel at, at at times if you do not make take care of the distal wire so these are certain points of uh, which, which i thought i would i would, I would bring to your notice before i I'll, i'll show you a couple of cases which again when i talked about the relative contraindications i will show you some situations where better planning could have made a better procedure out of these out of these patients and this is a gentleman uh, i hope i have the time i just take 5 minutes in showing these slides um this is a case which is taken up for an angioplasty an elderly lady who came with uh, came with angina and the and this was the lesion that they were looking at treating the something in the mid in the proximal led and something in the uh, in the, in the distal led so uh, the, uh, the the patient was taken up for a plasty and look at the look at the extent of calcium now when you're planning this procedure remember two things one is that there's extensive tortuosity of the uh, of the vessel extensive calcium in 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 all these vessels you look at it in different angles you realize that there is a significant significant number of tortuosity so you you need to plan out that getting anything into this vessel is going to take a hell of a lot of uh, energy and time um so this was this patient was taken up for a procedure with a uh, and the, the plan for the for the consultant was to do a balloon angioplasty and get a stent inside but as expected they they got caught with a dissection and uh, and and could could not do anything beyond that the, the, the no balloon and, and nothing would cross so they had already dissected by the time the by we, we got to the picture there was a dissection in the mid segment and uh, then there was no option here but to uh, rotably this vessel or send the patient for a bypass surgery the risk involved is <clears throat> there's a dissection flat in the in in the uh, in, in in the led getting anything down this was was going to be extremely difficult so with a great deal of pull pull push and pull we managed to get a microcatheter across into the in, into the distal vessel used a uh, wire and exchanged it for a wire moment the wire went in there and you can see the with the concert in the, on the vessel there's no flow in the uh, in, in in the uh, distal lead now this is situation this is a situation where you need you need to be extremely careful when you're using any of the debulking devices let alone let alone a a, a rotor blader the chance of perforation are going to be extremely high in the in these in the, in these situations so um we well, we we did pray to god and we took a 1.25 mm burr uh, gradually we do, we don't i mean as as a routine we don't use the the pecking motions pecking motions are more liable to cause vessel vessel, vessel injury especially when there is a wire bias so we go we go slow it's a slow contained drilling on the on on, on these patients till we uh, uh, we, we keep the uh, burr at the point of uh, for, for some time and then try and slowly advance the burr Uh, unlike certain situations where we use a sudden pecking to get a uh, uh, get 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 a burr across of course we managed to get that we get that across no and then use a balloon and eventually managed to uh, treat it with a stent and get out um, get, get the patient out of trouble so this is the situations where you are caught with your with, with, with your hands down uh, you have to force your hand and do certain situations but be careful when we're dealing with with, with, with these patients that the chances of dissections are extremely high and chances of perforations are extremely high and you need to be extremely careful when when dealing with these patients um this was this is another lesion where uh, we were again uh, in intractable angina we tried medical therapy he had a stent he had a, a stent put in the proximal circumflex uh, his bypass graft to the led was functioning bypass graft to the rc was occluded distal a uh, small distal rc no major vessel the vessel was was diffusely diseased and this was the only surviving vessel where he had a um, um, uh, where where we uh, where he had to treat this vessel um used multiple um uh used multiple balloons multiple wires um we ruptured at least six balloons in the in in, in the uh, in, in the vessel you can see that we got a uh, we got a uh, um, uh, guide liner all the way inside we got an opian balloon inside to a 210 opian balloon nothing would, would nothing would open the lesion again caught with our hands um, uh, i mean they can see the opian opian nc balloon at 30 atmospheres 35 atmospheres not giving way here uh, forced a hand um, to um, uh, do something about this again took a rotor blader wire down um, used a I mean, drilled it very very slowly you can see that we go very slow on the drill no no pecking motions continuous soft drilling at about 1160 to 180000 rpm till we got a cut across the lesion and of course then um, then then we 
pre-dilated pre dilation and stented the vessel. The last film I'll show you is a 86-year-old gentleman who had a and uh, uh, anterior OLMI recurrent uh, re re recurrent angina, recurrent angina uh, on the on the second day of the of, of the MI. And we know that this is a situation where we'll have a thrombus load, and he had a significant amount of calcium in the in, in the osteoproximal LED. So uh, we decided that we will we have to rotably this lesion. And uh, as as uh, we rotably the lesion, we ended up with slow flow, chest pain, hypertension, bradycardia, the, 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 the works. And we had to put in a temporary pacemaker wire also in these patients. Um, Rotoblading in acute infarct has to be extremely careful, and there's a very high chance of dislembolization of, of, of the thrombus. Um, so we did we did we did whatever was necessary in this in, in this in, in this patient use thrombo uh, thrombo suction to add the thrombosuction catheter to instill distill adeno uh, adenosine and nitroprusside and uh, eventually managed to, uh, uh, to 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 get this patient out. The reason I showed you these three uh, situations is these are these are now relative contraindications though not absolute contraindications but not something which uh, you should take it lightly. Uh, these these are these are life savers. Uh, the, 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 the rotobrator can be an absolute um, uh, godsend device in the right hands and can help you get, get yourself out of trouble. So, so I'm, I'm, as Dr. Sethi said, uh, I think it's some, some, something which all of us have to get uh, used to and all of us have to have some um, uh, ex experience of and, um, uh, and, and, and that will help us a long way in treating our patients better. Thank you very much. And I hope this was um, I mean, uh, not, not too long for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, for the sake of time, it was, it was a brilliant presentation and we learned a lot. And uh, it's always good to uh, see your presentation and learn from your experience. And the cases uh, were also you know, uh, quite, uh, quite um, <laughs> revealing and um, uh, telling us a lot about various difficult, uh, you know, steps that we can get caught in and how we can judiciously use rotablation in this particular setting. For the sake of time, I don't think we will take any questions here. And uh, if you may allow, I can come directly to my presentation. And uh, I would, uh, I would like to keep the presentation. Uh, very very short here uh, in terms of uh, so i would like to keep my presentation uh, very short i would briefly you know basically rush through my presentation here for multiple reasons one that we are we are running um, uh, quite late and i want to give adequate time to our guests to present their cases and have a discussion on that the second is most of the things are that we i have been that i will be presenting and i hope to present had already been spoken by one of the other candidates and a few other things will be spoken by our colleagues from boston if they get a time to present the troubleshooting because we are running late and the more so most of the things in far as the machine and the technique and the uh, small nuances are concerned, they are something that you learn when you are meeting physically face to face and we can show you the machine, we can show you the tips and tricks live on cases or on wet models. And you really can't understand everything of the machine setup uh, if uh, if you are just on a web platform. So most of the most of the people who have been using road ablation and who have used it, it's uh, this presentation is not for them, but this presentation is only for those people who have very limited experience of the machine. And they are really sometimes they comes in awe because of such a complicated system on their board. So just try to ease them and tell them which part of the rotablation system is what and how essentially you are supposed to use them at the catalog. But I'll try to really rush through the system just to this presentation. And we will be recording this presentation and sending you the entire two, three and a half hours of presentation so that you can go back to the presentation uh, any presentation that you think and and learn from it in the later on so coming to the road ablation system the road ablation we we already know is a diamond tip burr designed to preferentially ablate calcium and fibrotic blocks it consists of a fixed capital instrumentations consisting of a console here consisting of a foot pedal and consisting of an air tank in which uh, compressed air or liquid or, or nitrogen is is filled and then you have a disposable component in which you Sir, have to disturb slide up to only the three yellow. I think, 
स्लाइड्स आर नॉट स्लाइड नहीं सर नहीं आ रही पैनलिस्ट को भी नहीं आ रही मतलब पीपीटी को सेलेक्ट करना पड़ेगा ओपन नहीं हुआ है ओके सॉरी नॉट ओपन ओके सॉरी सॉरी सो लेट मी जस्ट गो बैक Is it visible now? Yes, answer, buddy. Yes. Okay. So, um, so as I was saying, uh, rotablation system consists of a fixed parts, uh, fixed part of, of of a console, of a foot pedal, and of a air tank, and disposable parts which consist of wires, which consist of an advancer, which is which is shown here, and which consist of the burr catheter. of different sizes and uh, although not frequently available with us you have a rota guide lubricant which is also part of the disposable or the consumable that come with the rota ablation system so uh, we have talked about the application of rota rotational ethrectomy in various clinical settings in great detail but uh, and we have and we have uh, seen that if you if you uh, do not use rota ablation in cases where it is required you end up into stents that cannot be delivered across lesion stents that cannot be stents or lesions that cannot be dilated and that ends up into procedural complications as well as a poor long term outcome and it has been seen in clinical trials that use of rotablation system may favorably impact of having less complication rate better angiographic res acute results lower degrees of tlrs and lower degrees of angiographic restenosis systems as dr ranjan shethi was saying that when we use when we do not when we sometimes we have this fear in our mind that rotor ablation causes a lot of dissection but on the contrary rotor ablation is a much cleaner system for the arteries in preference if this is a porcine model in when we use balloon dilatation there is a lot of dissection and a lot of injury that is happening here but when we use rotor ablation system it minimizes vessel wall stretch it decreases an an elastic recoil it eliminates the vessel barotrauma which occurs with high pressure balloons it produces it produces a much smoother luminal channel and it facilitates the stent delivery and expansion better than than just the balloons uh, again it was discussed earlier and we all know that we sometimes there is a fear in early operators that use of high pressure high uh, rpm <coughs> catheters <coughs> uh rotablation using diamond balloon diamond burrs at high rpms may cause perforations or dissection this is actually untrue the analogy is clearly of uh, electric shaving razor whenever this differential cutting means that whenever we if the the burr comes in contact the diamond of the burr comes in contact with the elastic tissue it's just going to press it and not cut it but whenever it comes with contact with inelastic tissues or calcified tissues is going to preferentially cut it like our shaving blades they don't cut our skins but they got cut through our hairs what happens to uh, the debris that is done the ablation in terms of in terms of balloon you when you use balloon you end up dissecting and you end up compressing the plaque uh, there and then in the vessel wall you uh, you you uh, intentionally do some sort of remodeling but when you are doing rot ablation system you essentially ablate the plaque ablate the calcium and this micro particles that is that is created which is 5 microns with the rotational ethrectomy and 2 microns with the orbital ethrectomy uh, go up and they do not clot the system they go up and are picked up in the distal circulation they are picked up with the reticular endothelial systems and destroyed uh, just to give you a comparison when you use embolic protection devices then these are meant to stop particles of greater than 100 microns so when you are when you are breaking down these uh, calcium and this plaque to less than 5 micron there is no way uh, it's going to i mean there is a chance of slow flow and no flow but then more often than not these these particles pass through microcirculation and are picked up by the reticular endothelial system and are destroyed uh, conveniently you have a console here that uh, uh, you have a foot pedal here and you have an oxygen tank and we will go about a detail i will not go for the detail because i don't want to complicate and overburden you but essentially in this console you have uh, you have a visual meter in which your rotation speed is shown your total procedural time is shown and it has various connections for both the uh, both the uh, input from your tank as, as well as uh, your connections 
of, of saline and your connections of the rotor ablation burr. In terms of the oxygen tank, just remember that you can use compressed air or nitrogen. And you have two sets of dial here. The first set is telling you the pressure inside the tank. It has to be a minimum of 500 PSI before you start the case. And the second one tells you the amount of pressure being delivered uh, distally. And there you need to have uh, the flow of, uh, with, with, with the basis of at least 90 to 110 PSI should be delivered to the console. Now, foot pedal and the Dyna Glide board is important. Let me, let me briefly tell all of you who have not used rotor ablation system. So there is a foot pedal which is used. So there are two modes for rotor ablation system. One is uh, the, the rotational mode, which is, occurs at anywhere between 150 to a 200 RPM. And then you have a Dyna Glide mode, which is half that speed, roughly around 50,000 to a lakh RPM. And the Dyna Glide mode is used essentially to take out your uh, rotor ablation burr of the system and to minimize friction while doing that. So while while burring the system, you do the, you, you require the, the the rotor mode, and while taking the catheter out, you require you require the Dyna Glide mode. And this is the foot switch on and off switch for the Dyna Glide mode. <coughs> Both the modes will work with the foot pedal, <coughs> but to switch between the Dyna Glide mode or the rotor extractomy mode, you will have to put this foot switch of the Dyna Glide switch it. When you push it, the Dyna Glide mode will turn on. And when you push it again, the rotational mode will turn on. So this is the construction of the foot pedal, which we can use both for Dyna Glide as well as for the rotational mode. And actually, this is the button that shifts between the Dyna Glide mode and the uh, rotational extractomy mode. So. Uh, in terms of the different disposable components, you have an advancers. Uh, of course, we will be discussing small nuances about all these things when we when we discussed uh, uh, physically when we meet over live cases or over a wet model. But you essentially have an advancer which is connected to the console, all the pressure lines, and you also have at the other end of the advancer the rotational ethrectomy catheter which is attached. And this catheter has a sleeve. And a burr at the end of the sleeve, the proximal end of the burr is, is uh, you know, uh, laced with diamond crystals, uh, which are which are at 20 to 30 micron in diameter, but five micron uh, of that diamond coated tip is projecting out of this front surface. And therefore, you get a five micron uh, particles on rotational. The posterior part of this uh, of this burr is not coated with anything. So we have to remember as Dr. Pravesh was saying, you can only in the rotor system, rotational etherectomy system, you can only ablate when going forward. You must not think that bringing the catheter back will also ablate it. And that's very, very important part of it. You have to keep on uh, rotate. You have to keep on burring only in the forward motion and the backward motion will not do any burring. And there are other small nuances about burr entrapment and all with which we'll be discussing in the upcoming case. While in orbital atherectomy, you can both uh, you, you, uh, you can do atherectomy both while moving forward as well as by moving backwards. There is a torque associated. There is a clip torquer that is used to navigate the wire as well as you know um, you can. It prevents the wire from spinning too fast uh, when you are rotation atherectomy. And another use of this torquer is to you know uh, get over the brake defeat and. Uh, when you are taking the catheter out, but I'm sure those of you who have not been part of rotational ethectomy, this is something that we cannot talk about it right now. So the rotational, the rotor catheter is 135 centimeters. It is enclosed in a sheet. As I told earlier, it consists of in its front portion, 2000 to 3000 microscopic diamond crystals that are around 20 microns in size with only five micron extruding from the nickel coating. Why? Torker, we have spoken about. Now, the rotor wire, it was uh, mentioned by one of the previous speakers, comes in two forms the floppy wire and the extra support wire. What are the differences here? And the rotor wire is a very, very essential component. And let me take, you know, let me go a little slow here to make you understand because it, it involves a part of very common complications that happen um, while using rotor ablation system is that. Rotor ablation wire is a 330 centimeter. It's a double length wire and it 
consist of stainless steel. And the difference is that while all the other wires that we use in our coronary interventions are 0.014 uh, inches in diameter, rota wire is 0.009. So it is much thinner than the, than the standard angioplasty wires that we use, except the tip. The tip of the rota ablation wire is 0.014. So the 0. Point, the remaining part of the wire is is 0.009, which is the main body. And there is a transition zone of around 13 to 15 centimeters where it tapers up, for, uh, tapers, tapers first down and then up from 0.005 to 0.009. This is the structure. And this is the structure of the floppy type of a guide wire in which the spring, which is 0.014, which is standard according to the standard angioplasty wire, this spring is 2.2 centimeters long. So what do we do to make it extra support wire? You know, you increase the spring length from 0. Uh, from 2.2 centimeters to 2.8 centimeters, and then you cut short this transition dose to 5 centimeters in length. And then by cutting short the transition zone and by increasing the length of the spring tape, you try to bring extra support uh, wire into play. Rota guide lubricant is generally not available in India. At least uh, it is not available with our hospital. So what we use is that we, instead of putting this lubricant, rota guide lubricant into the into the uh, saline bag, we use a cocktail. Uh, and the standard cocktail is mixing nitroglycerin and uh, and heparin and diltiazem and uh, creating a solution of our own to so as to prevent uh, uh, less uh, thrombus formation and a more uh, uh, a better dilatation while rotablation is taking place. So this this uh, this uh, this kind of cocktail that we create with nitroglycerin and diltiazem and heparin helps us, you know, cool the system while it is running. At the same point of time, prevents vasospasm and prevents thrombus formation. As Dr. Menon would have spoken, I mean, for early operators, when you are trying to do complex PCI, I would personally suggest you. To go with a seven friend system and go femoral but of course uh, with more experience you can go radial and you can go with a six friend system the six friend system will take a burr of 1.5 which is generally the burr is used for plaque modification in most of the operators if you really want a higher size of burr you would have to go to seven french or eight french system so early operators try to go femoral in your elective cases and try to use a seven french you know to have the ease of procedure for more experienced procedure you can move to radial and you can move to six fan systems. Of course, drip was told by Dr. Menon, and that is a pre-test that you do once you have connected your advancers to your catheters to your console. You you try to before you take the the rotational burr inside the guiding catheter, you would like to run the system again outside and look for the saline dripping, look for the rotational speed. Try to adjust the rotational speed at that point of time. Once your catheter is inside coronary arteries, the rotational speed should not be changed. And then you can look for the movement of the advances, whether it's working fine or not. When you are satisfied with this process, then you can push the uh, rotablation catheter inside the guiding catheter. Be very careful while doing this drip procedure. Try to keep the burr away from your gloves. Try to keep your burr away from any cloth or any gauze piece that is around. Otherwise, the rotational a burr will, because it is moving at such high speed, which catch the system and you will destroy uh, the burr and you'll have to change the system. So just the key procedure, do's and don'ts, and I will end here. <coughs> when you are using a Y adapter, uh, the screwed kind of Y adapter, uh, 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 do not tighten the Y adapter too, too much. Tighten it enough to achieve a hemostosis so that there is less amount of back bleed that is coming and you have less blood loss, but do not tighten it too much so that, you know, you have compression, you have, you have problems. Uh, sometimes there is kinks occurs and the sheet that is covering the road ablation bed burr can get compressed uh, with the Y adapter if it is pressed too, too hard. Do not uh, try in the first instances. I mean, there can be processes of continuous burring. The excellent case was shown by Dr. Menon where pecking motion was not to be done. It continuous burring was done. But generally speaking, for most of the paces, you should go a gentle pecking motion. You should go forward, come back, go forward, come back, 
and then specking motion, try to break the calcium slowly rather than trying to use force to drill it all in one source. So you should move three centimeters, two centimeters at one given point of time. Just, just, just move forward, come back, move forward, come back, and with gentle pecking motions, try to break the calcium. Always start burring from before the lesion, not within the lesion. Before the lesion, burr through the lesion and come back. Never stop inside a lesion and never uh, uh, stop distal to the lesion. So uh, you have to start burring process before the lesion, go in the lesion, burr it and come back and then stop. So your stop and start have to be proximal to the lesion. You cannot end the burring system within the lesion and you should not end it distal to the lesion. You should not keep the catheter at one particular point of time and continue to drill it. You should always engage it in a slow pecking motion, in a controlled motion, trying to feel the tactile feel, the auditory sensation, what kind of burring is taking place. And slowly with tactile feel, with auditory sensations, with the fall in speed, you will realize that your drilling has been successful, your ablation has been successful or not. As mentioned earlier, never adjust the RPM during ablation. It has to be done outside the body because a fall in RPM is one of the signs of more than 5,000 to 10,000 RPM is a sign that, you know, you're not doing a good job and you can, you can maybe come back and try to do it. So fall in RPM, sudden fall in RPM is sometimes indicated of bar, bar getting stuck up. So you must uh, look for the sign. And since this fall in RPM is a sign to, you know, be cautious, then you must not adjust RPM when the catheter is inside the catheter. Uh, never advance uh, to the burring point. Now, this is very important because we have seen that, that the, the tip of the wire was 0.014, while the burr takes the wire only up to 0.009. So the burr, since it's backloaded, it always remains in contact with the wire, which is 0.009. If while, if while performing road ablation system, the road ablation burr comes in touch with the distal floppy portion of the wire, it will encounter a 0.004 wire, which is larger, and it would cut through the burr. So wherever you are burring, your distal, fib distal radio opaque portion, floppy portion should be well ahead of your burring area. If your burr accidentally hits this distal portion of a radio opaque and a floppy tip, then it would cut through the system because the rotor guide, the rotor burr cannot accommodate a 0.014, which is a larger diameter of the wire. So never allow the burr to come in contact with this radio opaque floppy tip of the wire. Otherwise, it will cut through the wire. Never use the, never continue to burr in the same location at high speeds and, um, you know, avoid burring in the guiding catheter, except sometimes uh, you know, when, when you, while pushing the guiding catheter up, while we are trying to um, push a 1.5 in a six French and you are achieving some degree of resistance, some degree of torque builds up in the system. And then maybe in a guiding catheter, you can give a burr of half a second, just keep your leg and take it out. That removes the torque from the system and then you can move forward. Uh, except that season, you should never burr in the guiding catheter. So there are a lot of things to be talked about, small nuances, about complications, how to prevent them, what are the details of the machine. But I would, for the sake of time and for the sake of our future meetings to, to learn more, I would stop here and I would ask the, uh, Dr. Sharad to take forward to, to, to take the program forward with the case presentations. Dr. Sharad, are you there? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ashi. So, Dr. Akshay, do we have any questions in the chat box? I think Dr. Akshay is... So, should we move to... Because... Uh, I think we can make through case presentation. Hour? Yes, yeah, yes. We should go to the cases. Case right? presentations, yes. Okay. 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 So, our first presenter is Dr. Devinda Sriman. He is a consultant intervention cardiologist in Narayana Hospital, Jaipur. So, Dr. Devinda, are you here? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, please, Dr. So,
Yeah. Uh, this was a case of just. Uh, history of the patient, 63 year male patient, he was uh, having diagnosis of uh, lateral wall MI. In 2018, he underwent uh, angiography which showed triple vessel disease. He underwent primary angioplasty of LCX with uh, one stent and uh, it was done outside. Uh, other uh, arteries were also diseased like mid-diagonal uh, um, was almost 90% lesion. RCA was diffusely diseased with calcification also. And we uh, planned for rotablation of uh, RCA. So I'm uh, like root first we uh, took left femoral artery, sorry, right femoral artery. Later on with the complication, we took left sided of femoral artery also. Catheter initially was taken was GR 3.5, uh, um, 7 French catheter. I usually take uh, 7 French catheter. And uh, other wires which were used were filter FC and BMW wires, rota link above uh, 1.5 and 1.25 mm. So this was uh, angiogram of the patient. Uh, the LCX stent was patent. There was a diagonal lesion here. And uh, I'm going rapidly to the particular uh, but this was the RC lesion. We can see here the calcification, which is clearly visible on uh, just uh, without giving dye also. We can see here the diffuse uh, artery, a uh, diffuse disease of the artery. Then uh, we can see here in moving uh, frames. Then we started uh, doing rota ablation in this case. Initial resistance was there, then suddenly it opened up when uh, further uh, Rota ablation was tried with 1.5 uh, mm rota link, but initially 1.5, then later on uh, 1.25, uh, 1 then later on uh, 1.5 mm rota um, bow was taken. And uh, as usual, I usually take uh, like uh, TPI when I do uh, RCA um, rota ablation or uh, dominant LCX. This is uh, a picture standard because at this time, in uh, suddenly the but stuck into the distal part of the RCA. And uh, this was just uh, one frame. Rota is stuck in the distal part of the RCA. Patient started having hypotension and bradycardia. Actually, we created uh, hydrogenic acute MI in this condition. Started having ST elevation. Patient had ventricular fibrillation. TPA was already in situ. Inotropes were started. Patient had six times ventricular fibrillation. And fortunately, Every time uh, it reverted back to the normal sinus system. This was a very good thing in this condition because if it is not, then uh, possibly patient uh, we could have lost the patient. Now at this site, what are the what were the option? First, uh, many times we used to give uh, like uh, vasodilators to increase the size of the vessel at particular time. But if the patient is already having hypertension, bradycardia, sometimes it becomes difficult. Second option is uh, here to uh, like pushing the another wire. So we took uh, lateral, uh, sorry, left femoral artery assess. Here you can see the guiding catheter. We passed the wire, but uh, this uh, was, we was, I was not able to pass the wire and um, balloon across this. We use filter FC wire. So Bellout procedure, another catheter from the left femoral artery tried to pass the balloon with the help of whisper extra support wire but was not successful. Finally, what we did, uh, we uh, initially tried with the gently pushing the um, this uh, rota catheter. But when you uh, gently pull, then what happens many times, uh, This uh, because of the counter action, your uh, guiding catheter will go deep inside the artery. And second thing, the sheath will also go inside the artery. Sheath around the rota, rota uh, wire. So uh, here uh, is uh, like, because I have not taken the picture, it has, uh, this picture was taken just to demonstrate how we can go. So uh, what we can do is uh, that uh, we can cut this whole assembly uh, just distal to the advancer here and uh, the sheath is removed. After removing the sheath, we are having uh, options. One is like separate the advancer body from the catheter body, cut the drive shaft and rotavire together at the proximal side to the advancer, cut
cut the drive shaft sheath at the uh, at a side proximal to the catheter and remove the catheter body after that you can take out the sheath and then you have uh, so many options like one is that you can uh, push the snare uh, goose neck snare and uh, it can be pushed distal uh, to the near to the bar side and can uh, directly imply the force which can be transmitted directly to the bar means it is giving extra support to you second option is that uh, now you can pass the extension catheter there again uh, just to increase the force uh, which is transmitted and uh, actually and actually at the bus side so these two three measures are there and third thing is that if you cut uh, this sheet you are having a space by which you can go you can push the wire and balloon you can try uh, with the single uh, guiding catheter also rather than taking the access from the another side so if uh, you are thinking that your burr is stuck inside the lesion in the artery you can directly start from uh, this cutting the sheet taking out and uh, now you can apply wire and ball uh, wire and balloon to negotiate the wire across the lesion and to dilate the lesion where the bar is stuck this is one thing or you can take the another assess and uh, can try with the another guiding catheter so exactly in this condition i tried initially from the another side tried the balloon catheter but it was not crossing so i uh, cut the sheath and uh, finally the lesion could be taken out uh, easily i was fortunate enough here is like one uh, algorithm that if there is a uh, uh extension wire extension catheter can be uh, pushed inside second guide wire or balloon can be tried in this condition that is the surgery surgery is like uh, it is in this case i don't think that the surgeon could do something because patient was already having uh, six times vf and uh, was about to die it is uh, like unfortunate condition here we can, you can see that uh, the guiding catheter with another so with the keeping that wire we tried now balloon after taking out all the assembly and now i am going rapidly because uh, the rest of the procedure is similar like we uh, initially uh, try to push the wire uh, sorry we initially put uh, this stent in the proximal part because still it was having some resistance to go then uh, after dilating it further further final result i am this is another uh, stent so this was the final result uh, after doing angioplasty of this vessel so uh, heavily calcified vessel with the uh, acceptable results particularly in situation where patient was having vf st elevation and all these things i think the results were okay then uh, rapidly i will not go into this uh, one more case which is also important and uh, one just a minute not in the way she was a very uh, good uh, escape for the patient and uh, just i want to ask what did actually you did after cutting what was the thing done after cutting it was just the pulling of the bar or anything else no no just pulling of the wire could uh, do all the things actually means and nothing was required actually otherwise i would have used uh, we were not having guide extension catheter at that time so uh, yeah, possibly guide liner yeah. otherwise you would have taken a guide liner in, uh, yes, along, the, along that wire right sir this is another interesting case uh, rotabar not crossing the lesion actually so 68 year male patient diagnosed cad acs rbbb severe alveolar dysfunction 25% disc infection was there coronary angiogram showed triple vessel disease with lad osteal 100% uh, that was filling from the lcx uh, collateral up to the mid part lcx proximal 70% distal 90% stenosis ovum was having 70 to 80% stenosis rc was diffusely uh, disease 70 to 80% calcified lesion from proximal to the distal part means triple clear cut was a case of uh, for cabc 
He had history of recurrent chest pain. Patient was given option for CBG, but relatives and uh, surgeon both were not willing. Means surgeon when they explained that it is a high risk case and having uh, the ejection fraction of 25 percent, patient can have mortality. Actually, relatives refused. Uh, looking to the age of the patient, that uh, if something can be done on angioplasty, otherwise they were planning to keep this patient on medical management. So this was the artery, uh, sorry, sorry, just a bit. Okay. So yeah, this is a moving uh, picture. Uh, here we can see that the artery is diffusely diseased. One can see the calcification also here from begin to, from uh, proximal to the distal part. Here uh, we can see that it is diffusely diseased again. Can see the different view also. Calcification which is clearly visible here. You can see here the left, uh, sorry, left system. And uh, it was giving very good collateral here from the L6 to uh, LAD. This was the reason that uh, why uh, I choose uh, to go for the RC because LAD and L6 at least both were secured uh, by each other. Means uh, L6 was giving supply to the LAD, so there was uh, no much risk in this case doing a rot ablation. Otherwise, it could be fatal if uh, the LAD is being supplied by RC. In that condition, such cases can crash on table. This you can see another uh, view of LED which is nicely framed from the LCX. Now I am going rapidly to that particular part. So we started with the AL guiding catheter initially and uh, temporary pacemaker as usual. I usually uh, put it RCA which was diffusely diseased. Uh, somehow I was not comfortable uh, with the like this was not sitting very well according to me so I changed it to JR guiding catheter uh, and uh, I took rota floppy wire it could be passed easily here we can see the artery then now I started burying the RC and uh, at particular point here, it is it was progressing. Initially, if you can see that uh, initially it was not uh, progressing, but uh, after then it progressed to some extent. But uh, after that, this particular point means initial uh, progress. It was not uh, going ahead. Means it was not uh, burying the vessel. You can see here every time it is it was stuck in here at this point. So after doing multiple uh, rota ablation, usually we say that uh, every time the, it should not be more than 20 seconds and uh, uh, the particular time is also there that beyond which it should not be done. We can see here that uh, some dissection was there in the proximal RC. I was really disappointed that what should I do. I thought uh, I did multiple times here in this uh, uh, rota ablation. You can see here the force which, which this uh, guiding catheter was going back it was creating so much resistance here. So if it, it was not going, so what next? After doing multiple dilation like here, we did uh, dissection. Again, it was not crossing. We can, I checked this different view also. There was small uh, means angle here at this particular point. Again, trying and trying repeatedly but not successful. I thought that let's try with a balloon. Uh, I took a uh, two by uh, 12 mm balloon. Every time we, I think uh, in each and such complicated cases, you should not try to use uh, old balloon or reused balloon. You should try to here. Uh, still, I was not able to cross the balloon. I took 1.5 by 10 mm balloon also, but it was not crossing unfortunately. And the picture is not here. So after doing all these things, I was again, uh, I started again rotablating the lesion and again tried balloon, not crossing, not crossing, doing some multiple uh, dilatation, uh, sorry, multiple uh, try was uh, done to cross the lesion, but it still was, it is not crossing. There, because there was proximal lesion, so I thought 
uh, that at least I should uh, put a stand from year to year just to uh, seal this dissection and uh, let's uh, accept the result actually. But uh, like Dil Mange Morf, I again tried, again tried. But uh, every time this was stucking at that particular point, not crossing. So after balloon dilatation in the proximal part, again thought that something might happen, but something, some magic <laughs> might happen actually. I put one stand from uh, mid part to the proximal part and dilated it. Put another uh, stand in the proximal osteal part. Post dilatation was done. Then I again tried to uh, with another wire. I took uh, like passing the wire and uh, with the support of that wire. It was surprising to me that when I took another wire, the balloon could cross the lesion. Then I was very happy and uh, I dilated it aggressively, put another stent, third, fourth stent actually. And this was the uh, result after doing rotablation of and uh, post angioplasty, the results were like this. So sometimes when the rota is uh, not burying, at least you can try balloon also. And uh, what I learned from this case is that never lose the hope. That is the most important thing and try, try it hard until uh, means patient was also stable during all these procedures. So I could try all these uh, procedures. Thanks. So I think both of them were very, very, you know, bold cases that you showed. It's a it's very honest attempt and very bold cases and a lot to learn from. May I first uh, invite uh, I, our esteemed faculty members from outside, maybe Dr. Menon and Dr. Dr. Ranjan and Sanjeev Kathuria to have their comments. Why, firstly, from the, so for the sake of the uh, learning audience, why these complications in both the cases happened? Could could we have done could we have done anything extra to prevent the burr entrapment or to facilitate the burr movement? And uh, what are the learning key learning objectives of both these cases? So any of the three, you may go forward if you are comfortable. Sanjeev, so you are saying something. Can I can I make a comment? Yes, please, Dr. Manu. Okay, now in the in the second in the second case, I'll come. We start in the second case first. In the second case, um, uh, Dr. Devendra. Yes, sir. Um, when you have when you have a long lesion like this, especially with a, a little odd takeoff of the uh, of the RCA, um, two things you can do. One 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 is that I would I would I mean the, the way I mean the, the the speed at which you were pecking the lesion and allowing the guide to back up. Back, back out is something which you, you should completely avoid. Never ever allow the guide to back out. The guide backing out means your burr is hitting a lesion so badly that your chances, the chances are very high that the burr, if it slips, it will slip across a lesion without cutting and you may end up with a, with a stuck burr. So, Always, I mean, I, I, you know, the, the, if, if you look at the Japanese way of doing the, uh, and some of the Japanese uh, people who do these lesions, they go, they, they go very, very slowly across the, across the lesion. Take your time, go, go very slowly, drill it extremely slowly across the lesion. There is, there will be a certain number of heat generated at the uh, side of the burring, but it's better than just doing pecking motions like this. Go slow, burr the side, let the drill make its way through. In that case, you will drill slowly and surely through it. Now, that is number one. Number two, if you cannot uh, burr it, downsize the burr. Get a 1.25 burr. You may get a passage and you will you, you will create a passage for the 1.5 burr. Number three, um, realize that um, the, the, cutting, uh, the, the cutting edge of the burr has diamond, is, is basically diamond tipped. It's called diamond stirs. Like any, you, you, you rub sandpaper on wood, okay? After a certain amount of time, the sandpaper will get, I mean, that whole thing gets sort of soft. 
it will it will it will not it will not abrade the wood any further similarly when you keep on burning the lesion that the, the, you, if you take out the burr and see the burr will actually have burn marks on the tip and the diamond tip is effaced out so there's no cutting happening so sometimes you can change the burr to another uh, to, to, to another burr and you may you and, and you may cut through and the fourth thing that you did was yes the, you know sometimes there is a fibrotic element in the lesion which the burr will not cut the burr will only cut calcium it will not cut the fibrotic element so if there's a fibrocalcific lesion it may cut off the calcium part but the fibrotic part will prevent the burr from going down so use a guide extension catheter get a balloon inside and you will in all probability be allowed to be you be you'll be able to get another balloon across and dilate the lesion so this is just suggestions from the uh from from the uh, this thing coming to the first uh, case again uh the same concept that slow burring and listening to the noise of the bird even if you don't see the uh, drop in the rpm with the experience you'll realize that there's a there's a pressure there's a, a drop in the rpm by just listening to the noise of the bird and moment you hear that get your bird back don't let the the, the bird drop its uh, rpm more than 5000 uh, rpm and prevention of a of a stuck bird is always better than the treatment a stuck bird can be a menace luckily yes you can pull it out because of the step up as dr shetty says as shetty said there's a step up of the bird at the distal end of the wire uh, this there's a step of the distal end of the wire the wire is 0.09 0.04 is the tip so that step up helps you to hold the bird and pull the whole assembly back so this is just things which came to my mind in terms of the uh, And sir, what so about explanation? Is the wire uh, means the balloon was not crossing. I couldn't uh, understand. No, the balloon will not cross because you don't have support of the guiding catheter. Mm, maybe. Okay, you don't have support of the guiding catheter. You you go. You think guide liner would have helped the wire. The whole ah. wire bias changed because you had a stent in the proximal segment. The whole wire bias changed, and that's why you could get the you, you could you could get a balloon across. and you had a I maybe mean, if you had put a second wire at the same other in the first instance itself probably a wire would have crossed you just had to change the wires the, the, the bias of the wire can, can i come yeah. in one point yes, what's very important i think the whole concept of doing this with the jr catheter is doesn't stand correct i i would i would have differed on if your catheter was not aligning well put in one wire put in another wire and change the catheter on the change the uh, the guide on the wires because the alignment is not taking place in the primary go but once your wires are inside even with a small balloon in the proximal part inflate the balloon and you can then hook in your catheter i think the second the, the second later part can be that you use a guide liner or something i think the first part is that in such a tortuous in, in such a calcified lesion a guide support is a must so changing your guide to jr from jr to amplaza would have really helped initially you had tried it's not hooking Put in two wires. Put in three wires. On the wires, change the guide. So you are right. Uh, but in two, three my CTO cases, what happened? I started with the like uh, AL guiding catheter also. But when I used to push it hard, like balloon and wire and other things, most of the time they used to buckle into LV cavity. So that was actually uh, I don't know. It is actually experience of the operator. I had two, three such cases. that would really depend on the fact that where do you yeah. whenever you have such a thing once you must have taken a larger size catheter you have one 1.5 to all the three second thing is wherever you are parking the wire park it in pda plv and give it a little roll so your support of the wire becomes very good in a pda getting a rolled wire or in a plv which is going up getting a rolled wire will solve this problem that so that your slack in the system will be okay dr ranjan shetty your comments yes sir Yes, I would. And mute, sir. Yeah, yeah. So. I would agree with most of you. I think the guiding is the issue, and in uh, rota, I think the if you are doing a rota, guiding becomes uh, extremely important. So we need to choose the. You no, know, it's like CTO that uh, you don't have to do this unless we get the first few steps correct. So you need to get the guiding right, whatever whatever it is, whether it is left side, whether it is right side. You may have to use different guide for uh, you know LAD and L6 also sometimes just to prevent the wire bias. 
it may not be the same this so the first and foremost is the i think is the guiding and uh, you know like dr menon said i wouldn't uh, do that hammering uh, the lesion i would be very scared with everything buckling here and there um, uh, and what finally happened i think i'm sure all of us realized that was actually the uh, you know body wire uh, helping unfortunately with rota you can't have a body wire you can only have with this um, uh, i think today's era with the uh, guideliner again is a very very good idea because you could take it uh, quite close that rc being that uh, you know i felt it was little smaller so uh doing too much there is very risky these are the arteries which are uh, very risky sometime and if you have a complication it becomes very difficult to handle dr sharad your comments on this case and then we can move to no these two are the wonderful case dr divin so sometimes uh, when the guiding is a problem that that happened in your case sometimes you can no uh, but with the help of guideliner also that's the use of one guideliner also but for that you need a guideliner of at least 6 7 7 french so you can bar through the guideliner because support from the guiding is full poor just go to through the guideliner to the proximal part where was the artery is okay then you can bar through the guideliner that's the one indication of guideliner also yes, so it will provide the support and it will not uh, it will hold the guiding as well it will not allow to fall the guiding Right. Well taken, sir. And, uh, one comment, sir. One comment. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Kara. Yeah, it's a very well done case. Uh, I think uh, the one important thing that uh, in the second case, probably the, the angulation was also a problem. Once uh, the stent were placed, that angulation uh, act uh, was removed as uh, the stent acted like a guideline in this case. So you were able to uh, put your balloons uh, beyond that lesion. and one important thing that I, uh, in that i would like to say i had we had some same problem and the patient had a mid osteal and distal three lesion calcified lesion and uh, dr sharad came to my rescue he did that case with ebu so that was the case even the al or ar was not working so many times once your experience grows even the ebu might help if the root is large and you are not getting good support so in that only even after rotablation the ebu help some cases we may go with the some other choices sure for sake of time let's let's go forward to uh, just just one, just yeah, one comment rishi i you, you I mean, have all the, you have all the few comment Sanjeev, as well as the case Sanjeev, you can comment uh, uh, even after your talk <laughs> well, rishi, i'll start with it am i allowed to share the screen yes, yes please please we are waiting to hear from you so this was a little unusual in the sense that there was calcium there was porosity it was present all along in all the three vessels uh, the patient was explained about bypass but he practically refused it so this was this is about a 59 year male hypertensive diabetic non diabetic with copd and general exertion of the last one year increasing pain of the last two months with mild t inversion in v1 to v4 with hypokinesia of the anterior wall and a triple vessel disease it was, it was the patient at a high the so patient had a high syntax score of around 41.5 and the syntax 2 score was also quite high and the risk of mortality was uh, the pci the folio mortality was high but the patient simply opted for a pci and so we went there in fact we'll do it in 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 bits and pieces handle each artery one by one so this was practically the rca you can see it was a tortuous rca along with calcification since all the changes are more in the anterior leads this is the left system Once again, the left vein is small. You have a calcification starts from the very ostium, but you see important thing is this can be very well adventitial calcium per se. And this is a case which was about two years back. Didn't have any OCT. I was back up at that time, and uh, we could appreciate the calcium in the LED, but then thought that rota should be the one which should be able to help us bail us out of this case. So uh, with the seven F guide. i have put in a fine cross and with the fine cross i cross the lesion and after crossing the lesion i exchange the uh, the the uh, local house wire which i had used as a choppy cross copy wire with the rotor wire then the barring was subsequently done i would like to emphasize in the first case itself also but if you have a tortuous lesion if you have 
calcification. It is better to start with a 1.5 bar rather than a 1.5 bar. Even if this is not matching your heart rate, this is an important essential because the tendency of a 1.25 bar to get stuck up is much more than a 1.5 bar because of the shape of the bar. So, a pecking movement, uh, added it to the pecking movement only, uh, only, as Dr. Bellin is saying, if you're getting stuck up, you can do go along with the non pecking movement. After that, I exchanged the wire, rota wire, over a, 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 once again a fine cross, changed it to a normal floppy wire. And did ballooning with the NC 2.759 NC. But even after this ring, the balloon 2.75 so the new balloon was not causing. Right. Now you'll have to understand, is it that the rotor is not effective? I was not of this view that the rotor is not very effective because the wire bias of the rotor at the time when we were doing the rotor was exactly towards the calcium. So I thought the rotor has been effective enough. And then I tried to take a stand, it was just not moving. And you remember this is an ego tube guide which has an intubated key. One important thing here, which I will certainly ex uh, accept, is that the guide support is not good. I, the guide of the wire support is not good, but the guide is so well intubated. So I took the help of a guide liner, introduced the first stand with the help of a guide liner. At this time, the patient had become a little unstable and he was his cooperation had become a little less. So I was now of the view that I'll have to make sure that I come out of the case by taking a guide liner if the stent expands well. And luckily for me, the stent expanded quite well. Now, this is what I was talking about. Now, and then I tried to take the second stent. There was a brief ACE stop because I feel what has happened is the L6 is totally clogged and my guide was quite deep in. So even if after using the guide liner, since my guide was too deep in, the flow to the L6 had also stopped. And I would accept that the wire support should have been much better I had been in the distal LED. But you can see that the loop of wire in the mid LED in probably just the starting of the distal LED was good enough at that time. But then a little bit of CPR and I was able to, the, the, the whole circulation was stored probably because both the guideliners, the fact that the guide itself has been withdrawn. And with this, I could finally achieve a result where the LED was tackled well and the patient did well after that. I find that learning points are that the calcified lesions, cutting and rota are a must for lesion modification for optimal strength expansion, which all of us agree. Microcatheters are the tools for rota wire exchange, especially if you have a tortuous, where you expect that if you're trying to take a rota wire straight away and you buy a dissection, you would be in a complete suit. Mother and child catheter, Guidezilla, of course, can at times be life saving, especially during wrong procedures. Here, I should have gone with a Guidezilla straight away, but I, I think I faltered in. Uh, underestimating the fact that my rota has done all the job. So conclusion is imaging can be can prove to be a useful flavoring tool. I, mean, I, I, I accept we didn't have any imaging. And this imaging showed me that even after my first uh, after my uh, bearing with the 1.5 bar, the cuts are not there in the in the in the calcium. I would have definitely gone for a higher bar. It helps us to identify which kind of uh, which tool to be used according to the superficial or the deep calcium. Superficial, as we have already discussed, a rota or orbital athletomy can do the job, or a deep or cutting or a scoring balloon. Of course, scoring balloon has a better profile. Using appropriate technology as a first time therapy always scores above and should not be used as a bailout. I think the whole this concept of your, your our, our discussion today started with the fact that don't use them as bailouts. Use them as an upright, the up upfront therapy so that you don't have to land up in a bailout. So do according to the set rules, but be made able to maneuver around as per the requirements of the case. Now you can shift, you can shift gears and after using a rota, you can use a cutting balloon. In fact, after using cutting balloon, if you have, because if you don't find a dissection, you can even go back to a rota. But this you'll have to actually maneuver according to the case as per the requirement. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. Sanjeev, you have one more case. No, 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 no. Okay. So, uh, one thing is very clear if you are using rota, guide learner should be always be there. Yeah, but I feel the important thing to learn from this at any cost are that because the notion of the people is if you have a calcified lesion, if you have a tortuous lesion which is calcified, go for a lower bar first and then make space and go for higher. I think that notion doesn't hold true because the shape of a 1.25 bar is in fact not triangular in the base. So it is tending the tendency of a 1.25 bar to get stuck up is much higher than a 1.5 bar. 
if of course the lumen of the artery is not reducible for 1.5 at all you can't take it but always try if you getting both the combination of a of a, a tortuosity along with calcification you should go for a 1.5 another important thing to note is that if you have done balloon this your case yeah if you have done balloon if you have already done balloon then never use a 1.25 bar because even if you have created any kind of dissection the chances of getting stuck up are going to be much higher so contrary to the belief that you try to make space for yourself by using a smaller bar the belief should be that if the bar actually for a non dilatable lesion it is the bar which is going to make a space But if you are still stuck up with the thing, if you ballooned it, go for a high, but never go for. A I think even Caucasian phenomenon is more common with the smaller bars. Yeah, yeah. that that is because, nice that's because the shape of the this bar. Yeah, it the slips across the lesion and goes out uh, after the lesion. Yeah. But the one point. But now the most, uh, but many operators I have been talking, uh, very senior operators. uh who are doing more than thousands of the cases they are i i think they are again coming back to the smaller sizes bar even the most of the cases 70% 1.5 and up to 30 40% cases 1.25 yeah yeah if i can add dr gaurav yeah yeah Yeah, yeah. Yes, no, no. I think it's appropriate, right? It's the, it's never too big a bar, but it can't be too small also. So I agree yeah. that most yeah. of the time it is, you know, older definition of one point five is actually considered a small bar. Now it is yes. the most adequate bar. Hardly anybody uses one point two five because, as I think Dr. Sanjeev rightly pointed out, it it can do more harm than good and doesn't. If most of the time you do have to step up. One point five, on the other hand, works. Uh, well because you know 1.5 is a enough area to take the next gadget but uh, the important point i think uh, we, we have had a wonderful discussion it's all about facilitating rota is not equivalent to stenting it's more to deliver the next gadgets there are many times we have to do things much much more than that and i think we didn't discuss that post rota how do you know that rota has worked you know yes, you take 1.4 how do we know it has worked uh, well so the best thing is to take a, a you know a non compliant balloon almost uh, you know size appropriate to the vessel and uh, dilate it by just 3 to 4 atmosphere to see that you have burned it well and you have done it well there is no uh, if you if that balloon doesn't open you know that may be the time to upsize the bar then rather than trying very high pressure set that point and if you are not able to image i think that may be the time to upsize to 1.75 uh, but wonderful case uh, dr sanjeev i mean these are not comments on your case <laughs> your case is wonderful yeah yeah uh, dr ranjan said that in this case i had inflated with a 2.75 balloon after burning with a 1.5 bar uh -huh. and the balloon was to 16 and it was expanding well uh -huh. i still fail to understand that if uh -huh. it was expanding well why did i i was there was so much faltering with the with the stent it just didn't work in i would yes. say idzilla is essential part of such a case Yes, so yes. Idzilla, I was easily able to do the case, but I still feel that uh, as your way of one of the methods of causing is that we have cut the calcium well. If it's the balloon dilatation, I think it somehow failed in this case. Yes, I think it is a bow shape LED. The angle, correct. The angulation, angulation, sir. We have also yeah. an contrasted problem. I think angul angulation goes hand in hand with the calcium. So we have also used many times even in STEMI also. Last time we have to use a guide liner. And it's yeah. almost a bow like bow shape LED in our own bottle. I would yeah. I think the angulation agree. that was the stop. Yeah, I, I think this is yeah. I think this is because of multiple factors like poor guide support, poor wire support, bad angulation. These all things are contributing to the failure in this case. Correct. And also uh, maybe a buddy buddy wire. Uh, I mean, obviously there's no harm in using a guide liner. It's obviously much better. But even the buddy wire, like uh, Dr. Devendra's case, sometimes does wonders. Yeah. yeah. Even. even to you know if you want to enter the side branch uh, sometime when you don't take a you are not able to take a stent to side branch when you are not able to take a, in a little under expanded stent not able to take a balloon the body wire sometime works because that means it's all angulation and the pressure transmission which which is playing around yeah did uh, you stent expand well i think i missed yeah, that yeah, yes that did, the stent expanded well so i'm quite i think the point raised by shrad sir is very correct that uh, the guide support is not good actually you should have shifted to an applauser guide 
And Correct. the second thing is the wire support was also, if I could have gone much deeper with the wire, so as yes. to increase my support. But yes. probably the patient became unstable at this stage. So I, at this stage, and Sita had a guideliner uh, on table. I thought this is going to be 100% secure. If I take a guideliner, if I'm able to take a guideliner in, I'll be able to uh, restore the flow. Yes. But yes. the other important thing I really want to convey is that that 1.25 bar is basically shape is different from all other birds. Mm -hmm. The 1.25 bar is triangular at the base. All other birds are over. So the, even if it's the speed has decreased, they tend to come out of the leash. But since this does not have the oval shape, this bar is different in shape from all other bird sizes. It tends to get stuck. So I had used a 1.5, this was something which I wanted to convey. Yes. Uh, when uh, like when I use uh, guideliner in such cases, to reduce the time of ischemia, like because the guideline is of larger size, but uh, it goes into the vessel, it usually occludes the blood flow to some extent. So what I usually do that I put the guideliner and along with that, I put the stent and I push both simultaneously. And the, when the guideliner is inside, immediately I push uh, the stent. So to decrease the transit time, transit time means once you are putting the guideliner, then you are putting the stent rather than two can simultaneously be taken and can do the last system because uh, Vinder, I, I think I think a very important thing to put a guideliner is to make sure that when you're taking your guideliner inside the artery, it should stay central. So always whenever you are pushing a guideliner into an artery, always over a balloon. Because yeah. you must make sure that the guideliner does not do any shrugging business with the side with the endothelium. When you are going to do that, you will never be doing a ballooning because if your stent is inside, you have to inflate the stent then. You can't put a stent inside, inflate it and then take a guideliner. So I think uh, one of the basics, I think Dr. Ranjan and Dr. Benin can tell more. One of the this basics of putting a guideliner is guideliner, This technique, no. balloon assistic technique for guideliner has been described, but sometimes yeah. if, if you are in a hurry or patient uh, is... Sometimes in, I agree. Sometimes, sometimes I agree. you can go straight forward with the stent. Yeah, we can, but the technique no, no, no. is if you're doing an elective case, if you're not stuck up, you have thought about the case, you know this is going to happen. Always, always make sure you take a balloon, centralize your guideliner, take it to the place you want, do a balloon assisted guideliner in production, and then take your stent. Yes. Of course, in an emergency, you must take it straight out because then yeah. you are already losing the patient if you don't. Yeah. Act. If you have pre dilated the lesion, I think. Even no, then, the, even then. Yeah. Even yeah. I think Dr. Devendra is typically, as Dr. Sanjeev says, you take it over the balloon, the balloon is inflated, then you take the guideliner. Typically, that's how you take, but there are many ways of doing it. Um, uh, but I think one more thing, what you are worried about ischemia, Dr. Devendra, which is a valid point. But once the guideliner is in, you still get a pressure, yes, you know, yes, yes. that you, you can see the distal coronary pressure wherever the guideline, because now the it appears like the as far as pressure is concerned, it's extended. So if the pressure is fine at that time, it should be okay. Sir, I'm so not talking about the artery. I'm talking about the side artery. Like in this case, uh, patient uh, was uh, destabilized because of decrease in flow in LCX rather than okay. LAD. Than LAD, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. So in the right system, it is not a problem. It is the left then, system. Then, then that, that, but that amount of, I had intubated the guide only with the guideliner. Mm -hmm. If you just take a guideliner pocket, it will never decrease the flow of the L6. That's the basic function. Otherwise, you can even intubate a guide. So this guide was not intubated till the guideliner has reached a particular point. But still, of course, the mechanism is the L6 got uploaded and the LED was already uploaded and this is what, and the RC is already hanging. Obviously, this brought the patient to a uh, edge of the cliff. So I hate to I hate to interrupt a very very I hate to interrupt a very very interesting uh, discussion, but yes. um, you know I have to play moderator because we've already overstepped by more than forty five minutes. It's very very interesting discussion, and just because the none of us are willing to stop the discussion, it shows <laughs> that this evening yes. this evening has been fruitful, yes. Uh, yes. at least for the faculty, and I hope the evening has been fruitful for the participants and the learners as well. So. Uh, uh, it's my, you know, very, very, it's a duty and it's a, it's a pleasure to really thank all of you for sparing more than three hours of your time on a Saturday evening. It's a, it's a family time. We, we put like spoke in your weekend plans, but I think uh, I personally, and I think I can speak for all the faculty members. It has been a learning experience for all of us. It has been such a, such a pleasant, such a joy to see all of you 
at least, I mean, virtually, I hope we meet physically soon uh, in terms of when, when the travel is allowed. But it's been a wonderful evening and we will continue these sessions forward. I thank all of you for spending your, your, your precious time here, for sharing your point of view and for helping us learn together and guiding this whole learning process in a spirit of academic camaraderie. So hope to see all of you um, very, very soon, especially uh, Dr. Ranjan Shetty, Dr. Devend, uh, uh, Dr. Katuria, my old friend and a, and a dear friend. I think Dr. Menon has left, but I, I, I request the Boston team to uh, you know, convey our extreme gratitude to him as well. I'm really sorry to uh, Deepak from Boston team. He was supposed to have a presentation, but I think we got so engrossed in our own, you know, um, own discussions that you know we overstepped our time, and and he could not present. But I'm sure there would be another day, and I look forward to meeting all of you in future also in such programs. Thank you again. Have a good night and a great thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Anjan. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, on the behalf of Boston Scientific, uh, I would like to express my thanks to uh, all the faculty members and attendees who have uh, given their time on this Saturday evening and made this session wonderful. And I hope with the key discussion, uh, the overall concept of this program has been uh, proved good and in future we are expecting to do more such programs. Thanks to all of you once again on the behalf of Boston Scientific. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night, all of you. Good night, sir. Good night. Record.